Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Russ Cohen. I'm from the town of Arlington, Mass. I grew up in the town of Weston, Mass, not far from here. Sort of a similar deal to Stowe. In fact, when I grew, moved to Weston in 1964, it was like Stowe is now. Not anymore, unfortunately, but you know. So coming back here this afternoon, you know, gave me a very familiar feel and you know, my stress levels started going down. And so it was very, very great to, to have a little time with you out here in the bucolic burbs. So anyway, uh, so um, I uh, have been connecting people to the outdoors to their taste buds since I was in high school. So that, uh, my senior year of high school, I taught other high school students how to forage. And that was in 1974. So, uh, so that's, uh, what, 42 years ago. And I'm still at it. And I do about 40 programs a year all over New England and upstate New York, um, connecting people to the outdoors uh, by nibbling on it in a safe and environmentally responsible way. So that's what the talk is about tonight. Hi. There's handouts and of the, the legible and the edible kind. And they're up here. So let's uh, expose another layer of these black walnut honey squares. And then we also have, how is the tea? Is it OK? Oh, good. Excellent. So that's a pretty common plant. You'll see that in the show in just a second. Let's make sure this works. Great. OK. So anyway, um, uh, I'm going to talk about a few plants that I don't know of a spot in Stowe where they grow. But most of the stuff grows near here. And there are a few things that are of um, you know, more of a coastal vintage. But I trust that you get to the coast from time to time. So perhaps you'll run into these plants there. All right. So. Um, before I get into specific plants, and let me tell you, the plants are organized chronologically from the beginning of the foraging season, which starts in April and goes through November. That's the main time when I'm out gathering things. And, um, uh, and for me, foraging is a great way to enrich all the time I spend outdoors, whether it's out here, uh, north and west of Boston, or uh, even in downtown Boston, where I used to work, there's foraging opportunities in the parks in downtown Boston. And of course, along the seacoast, as I mentioned, in the mountains, there's edible wild plants all over the place. So it's really fun to know this stuff. Even if you're not actively hunting and gathering, just to see this stuff as you're walking along the trail, it's like having old friends come and greet you as you're walking along. So that's why I do it. In case you're wondering, I'm not a vegetarian. I'm actually pretty omnivorous. I actually have a relatively conventional diet as I go to supermarkets and restaurants and I also patronize farm stands and farmers markets and I grow lots of fruits and vegetables at home but in addition to all that there is at least 70 species of wild things that I'm eating too but I look at it as a fun complement to conventional diet rather than a substitute for regular eating. All right so um, I do though espouse conservation ethics while I'm out foraging and I encourage you all to do that too, especially when native species are involved because these are plants that often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food as some other important portion of their life cycle. So uh, you wouldn't want to pick so much of a native species that you could upset the ecological balance in any way. So I encourage you to do that and I'll get into more specifics as we go through the show. Um, but having said that, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, there are plants that you might be interested in that are on another list, a more notorious list, and that's the state invasive species list. So here's a book the state put out uh, about 10 years ago that's intended to educate people about the 66 what are considered to be the most ecologically disruptive non-native exotic species that occur in Massachusetts. So the species in this book are definitely bad news ecologically, but if there's a silver lining to the cloud of these invasives, perhaps it's a fact for some of these species, they're edible. In fact, out of the 66 species covered in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as at least most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of them as we totally could. I'm totally serious about that. It's guilt-free foraging. You can't pick too many of them, provided that you're not spreading them around in the process, but that is easily avoidable. All right, so I want to give you a chance to try an invasive species right away, and it's this plant that I had up there. So this is a plant called autumn olive. A lot of people call it Russian olive. Yeah, that's an invasive species. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, 
Now, uh, if you don't know where this plant grows in Stowe, and it's blooming right now, and I will show you photos of the flowers, and they have a very nice smell. So it's conspicuous in the landscape now, but all you have to do is head west toward 495, and it's like lining both sides of the road, and at any of the exits, and in the gravel pits, and in the land, old apple orchards, and throughout that area, because the Mass Highway Department planted it. <laughs> Thousands of the plants before they knew it was invasive, so uh, to their regret. But anyway, but my attitude about invasives is that if the ecologists remove them, fine. But in the meantime, if they're out in their landscape and they're yummy, I'm going to pick them. I'm going to tell other people how to pick them too. All right, so what I do with this plant is when the fruit is ripe, so this photo I took in October, so that's when I'm picking it. And I'll give you more details about that later. But what I do is I pick the fruit, I puree it, and I dehydrate it, and I make a fruit leather from it, which is what is in this container. So please take a piece. So um, let me talk about one other conservation issue before I plunge into the show, and that is um, what's the impact on wildlife by foraging? Are you stealing food out of the mouths of deserving animals by going out there and picking it before they do? Well, first of all, if you're showing some restraint and some forbearance on the native species and leaving plenty behind after you harvest, you're leaving plenty behind for the animals too. But for those of you that remain concerned about this, it might help you to know there isn't a 100% overlap between what people can eat and what animals can eat because our taste buds and our digestive systems are different. So for example, poison ivy. A lot of bird species eat poison ivy berries, deer browse and poison ivy leaves, and they can have all the poison ivy they want. We're not gonna compete with them over that. But then I'll be leading a uh, program outside doing one of my walks and someone in the group, group will say, Russ, I was in my yard the other day and I saw a mushroom with an animal bite taken out of it. That means I can eat it, right? And the answer is no, at least not necessarily because as I said, number one, there isn't 100% overlap between what people can eat, what animals can eat. And number two, you don't know what happened to that animal after it took that bite <laughs> out of that mushroom. It might have died a horrible death. So animals can make mistakes too, so you can't count on them. All right, so where do you go and pick stuff? That's the last topic before I plunge into the show here. So, well, first of all, let me tell you where I don't go to pick stuff. I don't go to pick along heavily traveled roadways like Route 2. I don't go to places where everybody takes their dog for a walk, although if something is growing above a certain height, even the Great Danes can't reach it, and I don't worry too much about that. And, um, you know, there's no magic formula about this. Just use your common sense. So if... Um, the plants that you want to pick from don't look healthy. They look spotted or wilted or stunted. It's possible that they were sprayed with herbicides or that they're picking up some contaminants in the soil that you don't want to be eating. So uh, I would just give those a pass and just wait till something looks better. Um, and uh, so where do I go? So I'll give you a couple specific examples and then a generic example. Okay, one. A specific example, and it doesn't apply immediately to here, but it's uh, you know within an hour of where we are right now. So here's my foraging book, and this was published by Land Trust, and it's the Essex County Greenbelt Association. This is the Land Trust that covers Essex County, Mass., which is Northeast Mass., the area from Lynn, Marblehead, Salem, uh, Rockport, Gloucester, all the way up to Newburyport and west to Lawrence and south from there. And Greenbelt allows foraging as a permitted activity on all their properties that are open to the public. So you could just go to their website, ecga.org, and just pull up their trail maps and go to one of their properties and start nibbling. It's as simple as that. Then also, uh, the state uh, Department of Fish and Game, which I used to work for, they have a division of fisheries and wildlife, and they manage what are called wildlife management areas, WMAs. And they allow uh, nut gathering, berry picking, and um, what's the other one? Fruit, berry picking, nut gathering, oh, and mushroom hunting uh, on those properties as long as it's from personal consumption only. So you can't give it to a farmer who's going to sell it at a farmer's market. You can't give it to a chef who's going to put it on the menu. That's all commercial use. But if you're picking it just for yourself, you could have a couple friends over, that's fine, but, but no commercial use, okay? And then the third piece of advice I have, and this has perhaps more direct applicability in Stowe, is to forage at organic farms. And I want to say in the very same breath, I don't mean to deter you in any way from patronizing the farm stand and getting a CSA share, if that might work for you. 
as many edible weeds and invasive species we have out there, and you're gonna see a lot in the show, it's not enough to make a significant dent in the food that we need. So it's important to support local farming. Organic farming is a great way to go. So I encourage you to do that. But in addition, there's great foraging at organic farms. So why is that? Well, reason number one is the obvious one. They're not slathering everything with chemicals. Reason number two is that um, the way that they manage weeds on organic farms is they do it strategically. They're not picking up every single weed constantly every single day. They weed the areas where you know they've got the young vegetables just growing up that could be outcompeted by the weeds and stuff like that. But once they've pulled the spinach out or the peas out, whatever, and they haven't replanted that area, they're not going to weed it. And so if you visited a, a organic farm at the right time and you find patches like that, you can find huge amounts of weeds, enough to feed whole armies. So if I've got a di big dinner party planned and I need lots of raw material, I'll go to an organic farm and find all I need that way. Then the third reason is the wonderful living soil that makes the organically grown vegetables so nutritious to eat. All that great stuff is getting into the weeds too. So the weeds you harvest at organic farms are gonna be particularly nutritious to eat. And then the fourth reason is the um, edges of organic farms often have good edge habitats where there's fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes on the edge of the field. So my advice is to form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds, you want the weeds, so potentially it's this great partnership. Don't just go there and start picking. Talk to the managers first, but usually they're fine with it. In fact, I get invited to a lot to give foraging talks at a lot of organic farms, so I think they see this energy there. And one of those farms, by the way, it's right on Route 117, a road you're familiar with. It's in Lincoln, so heading toward Waltham. And it's called Blue Heron Organic Farm, and it's just past Drumlin Farm on the opposite side of the street, just after you cross the railroad tracks. So there's a farm stand there, and when that farm stand is open and the farmer, Ellery Kimball, is there, she said it's fine if people come and pick her weeds. Okay? All right, so let me get into the show. Feel, we've got a nice uh, small group here tonight, so feel free to barge in with any questions. All right. Okay, what is this plant? All right, but which species is it? Ostrich fern, very good. So that turns out to be important because not all ferns are edible. In fact, a really common mistake by people in Eastern Mass is in the spring you're walking through the woods and you see a bunch of ferns at that curled up fiddlehead stage and you say, oh, fiddleheads, it must be the same thing I've seen for sale in the stores. And so you pick it and you bring it home and you cook it up and you take a bite and it tastes horrible and you say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where you went wrong is you harvested the wrong species of fern. I only know of two species that taste good that grow around here and only one species that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one, the ostrich fern. So I'm gonna teach you the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. First thing you wanna look for is habitat. Ostrich ferns tend to prefer alluvial floodplain soil. And where you're gonna typically see that it's along a large river. And we don't have a lot of large rivers in Stowe. You know, you've got the Assabet, but that, that, that isn't really, there, are, there isn't a lot of alluvial habitat in the Assabet. But you're in the Merrimack watershed here, so if you go to the main stem Merrimack River, you can find the ostrich fern habitat. And that would be in Massachusetts, but this photo is actually taken along the Connecticut River out in Deerfield, where there are thousands and thousands of ostrich ferns. So um, I occasionally run into ostrich ferns in other places, but if you want to see you know, large patches of it, that's where I tend to see them. Okay, and then um, as the little fiddleheads are developing, you'll notice that they're in a little vase-shaped clump and also that each of the little stems on them has a little gouge that runs down the center of the stem and if you cut the stem and you looked at it in cross-section, it would look like a U, all right? And then you'll see these little papery little scales that were wrapped around the fiddlehead parts and those flake off really easily with your fingers so it's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. And then the last thing to look for are the fertile fronds, the spore-bearing fronds that are tucked, uh, you know, they never get to be as tall as the fully-fledged fronds. And, uh, and they'll be there when the fiddleheads are coming out. They won't be at every clump of the ostrich fern fiddleheads, but you will see them in the patch. And those fertile fronds also have that U-shaped groove running down the little stem. So if you remember all that, that is the ostrich fern. And uh, so let me just... Uh, um, talk about conservation in the context of this plant. So this is a plant that people will go and pick and sell to, you know, even supermarkets and stuff like that, and you'll see them. Although most of the fiddleheads that are sold in supermarkets around here, I think, are brought down from Canada. But anyway, uh, 
So unfortunately, uh, sometimes the pickers will be a little bit unscrupulous in how hard they hit the patch, and they'll pick more than I think they should for actually the sustainability of a harvest from that patch. So the advice that I give is pick one or two of the little curled up parts per clump. That's it. Let the rest grow out. Because if you picked every single one, and then the plant produced a couple more to um, um, uh, recover from that, and then somebody went into the woods a week or two later and they picked those two, that's gonna sap a lot of strength from the rhizome and you could kill the plant. So one or two per clump, that's a sustainable level of harvest. And I'll talk a little bit more about conservation in just a second. Okay, so if you've ever bought the ostrich turnips at the store and cooked them up and you weren't particularly impressed with them, you might want to think of using the sweet corn method with them, which is basically sprint from the ostrich fern patch to the spot. And actually, this was illustrated very well by this naturalist, this woman, Beth Basler, who took me and a bunch of people to a fiddlehead patch out in Western Mass, and she brought her cook stove with her, and we were eating the fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them, and they were amazing that way. So that's how you'll get them at their best. All right, anybody know what this plant is? All right, this is a plant you may have heard of. It's called the wild leek, or ramps is the foodie name. And this is a plant that does not grow in eastern mass unless you plant it, so you won't find this naturally in the wild. It's more of a western New England plant, so western mass, Vermont, uh, western Connecticut is where you're more likely to see it. And uh, it's a wild onion. We have wild onions that have a similar flavor that you can harvest around here, but anyway. so. This is a plant that's a native species. It grows in sensitive rich woods habitats that it shares with a lot of our favorite ephemeral spring wildflowers like trilliums and bloodroots and stuff like that. And Native Americans use this plant. In fact, two city names that you will know, Winooski, Vermont, and Chicago are Native American names for this species. So anyway, uh, it's a plant that um, uh, country people knew about that live where the plant grows and they might collect some when they're out trout fishing or turkey hunting, things like that, and all that was fine. Then about 10 or 15 years ago, this plant began to experience a meteoric rise in popularity as the chefs and the foodies started hyperventilating about it, getting very excited about it. And then demand rose exponentially. And what unfortunately has resulted is this gold rush mentality on the part of some people where they go into the woods not to commune with nature, not to have any connection themselves with nature, but just to dig up a patch like that and convert it to cash. And, and I've been in places in the Berkshires where I used to see patches like that where they have been completely wiped out. Every single plant was dug up. And these are not people gathering for themselves or a couple of friends. These are people that are selling these plants in a very large scale. And so not only is that bad for the sustainability of the plant, because once you dig it up, it's extirpated. It's locally extinct from that area. It's not going to come back. And also, the, um, if you leave any bare soil behind, you're creating this ideal growing medium for the invasive species to get a toehold in this sensitive rich woods habitat. So, um, so that's bad news. But there is some good news. So, Here's a close-up of what the plants look like. So they'll have two or sometimes three leaves that go down to this little scallion-y type bulb. And, um, and the leaves are delicious. So you don't have to dig up a plant to eat it. And so the word that I've been trying to get out to the chefs and the people that are picking for the chefs is please consider confining your, confining your harvesting to one leaf per plant only. Pick the leaf off the plant, leave the remaining leaf or leaves attached to the bulb, leave the bulb on the ground. That's a totally sustainable way of interacting with this plant. Then the patches will continue to exist and thrive in those locations and we'll get the wonderful flavor of the plant and that'll be great. So I have some anecdotal evidence that uh, my advice is getting out there because uh, a few years ago I got an email and the email said wild ramps in the subject line and I thought, oh great, some foodie has tracked me down and wants me to spill my guts about some location of some wild leak patch, they can go uh, um, dig up all the plants. And it turned out that email was from the produce manager at the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op, which is the one that serves Montpelier, Vermont. And he was writing to tell me that they had decided at their food co-op to sell little bags of only one leaf per plant collected ramps. And they wanted permission from me to put a little message for me in each bag to explain why that was a good idea. So I was very grateful for that. All right, so that's one bit of good news. Uh, 
because, uh, just to go back in the bad news one more time, so uh, if you look on the left, that's a picture I took at a famous restaurant in Westchester County, New York called uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns Restaurant. It's run by celebrity chef Dan Barber, and he wasn't even using the bulbs in his cuisine. He was just pickling them and selling them at a gift shop, and in my view, those plants were unnecessarily dug up. And even the food co-ops, some food co-ops, were selling whole ramps. So, and you know, they've got the little local sticker on there. And you know, if you're the typical shopper, you say, local, local, I'm supposed to buy local. Local ramps, oh, I'm doing a good thing by buying the local ramps. And you're not if they're dug up plants. So anyway, but uh, there is an alternative, an alternative that you could do here, and that is you could grow them. You could have a little ramp patch established on your own property. Where do you get the plants to start out? From Garden in the Woods in Framingham. I was just there today. I saw that they grow ramps in a stock bed there, and they've potted up a whole bunch of plants. Um, and so you could just buy a half a dozen plants, yeah, put them in. The yeah, and put them in in your, um, you know, you'd, you'd want to plant them in a place where eventually it's going to be shady, because this is a plant that tolerates shade. Um, and, um, and then you could have your own ramp patch and enjoy them. But if you do that, I bet you don't dig up the plants because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. No, you'd leave the plants there, pick a leaf off occasionally, and then you'd have them to enjoy for later on. Okay, anybody know what this plant is? Okay, it is stinging nettle. All right, and this is one of the first plants I'm gathering, typically first green plants I'm gathering in the spring. And I will just snip off the top cluster of leaves uh, on each little plant and then bring them home and then I will uh, steam the nettle greens in a big cooking pot and it shrinks quite a bit when you do that and when you steam the nettle greens it converts the chemical that causes the sting in the raw vegetable into a protein so it makes the plants very healthy for you and once I've steamed the nettle greens you can incorporate them into different dishes like this cream of stinging nettle soup which is a recipe in my book and also stinging nettle balls and this is just the retro spinach ball recipe that uses Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together. <laughs> and you substitute the steamed nettle greens and it works great. All right, anybody know what this plant is? Mint. It is a kind of mint, very good. Catnip. Catnip occasionally grows wild and it has the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you can use the leaves fresh or dried if I forgot to say that. Okay, here's a plant called curled or curly dock, and I saw this one on the way here today along the roadside. And um, it is a cousin of the French sorrel, so you can use it the same way. This one will have a bit of bitterness to it, so I tend to blanch the leaves, drop them into, into rapidly boiling water for 20 seconds. And that takes the bitterness away, and then you can use them like you'd use cooked spinach, like spanakopita, the, the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough and the feta cheese. The, the blanched uh, dock leaves work really well in that recipe. So, uh, and this plant is the antidote to the sting and stinging nettle. So you get stung by a nettle plant, you grab a dock leaf and get the juice out of it and then rub that juice on the place you got stung. It helps make the sting go away. All right, so uh, I also have live versions of what's appeared in this slide right here. So you can pass that around there and pass this around here and get a good look at it. Okay, so this plant is at or near the top of the invasive species list. It is despised by ecologists and uh, by homeowners and lots of people because once it gets established, it's really hard to eradicate. And a lot of people call it Mexican or Japanese bamboo. It's actually not even distantly related to bamboo. Its real name is Japanese knotweed. Okay, and so, um, so as I said, it's not related to bamboo. It's actually related to rhubarb. It tastes like rhubarb. Uh, and I use it instead of rhubarb, and, uh, and I harvest a ton of it every year. So, um, so if you can imagine, in the fall, this is the plant that gets to be about eight feet tall, and the stems turn this sort of reddish-brown color, and they look like dry bamboo. Okay, and then in the spring, in the midst of all that dried stuff or, or whatever got knocked down by the snow, you have these sprouts coming up that look like that, look like asparagus with little red dots on them. So at that stage, you can just snap it off at ground level and just steam the shoot for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to eat this plant is when they get a little taller, and this is what I call the wild rhubarb stage, which is basically what you're looking at, what I passed around. So like 
this tall or a little taller than this. And I'm picking the fattest sprouts I can because I want to peel this very outer layer off. There's nothing poisonous about it, but it's stringy and it can get caught in your teeth. So I'll take a little paring knife and just get it started at the bottom and I'll just pull the outer layer off till I get this done. And then you see there's a stem on the right there where I've done that. Uh, and at that stage, the, the, the st stem is perfectly edible raw. It's tart and juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up and use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here's my strawberry knotweed pie. I made one of these just this afternoon. Wow. And virtually everybody I feed this to prefer this over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's really yummy. And so you might be looking at that and say, well, OK, it's yummy, but I'm intimidated by pie crust and a latticework top. I don't know if I can pull that off. So I'm going to show you a way to use the knotweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever is you can just take those little pieces and fill them with like a flavored cream cheese or a salmon mousse and something like that, and they're delightful, and uh, there's really no uh, skill at all involved in that. All right, so here's the other plant that vies with Japanese knotweed to be the most hated invasive species. This is garlic mustard, and in this area of the world, a lot of conservation organizations will organize garlic mustard pulling parties to try and control this. One of the ways of controlling is to yank it out of the ground. And you want to do it at this stage and before because if it gets much older than this, it's actually going to start to go to seed and you'll be ineffective by yanking it out of the ground. So you want to yank it out before the seeds form. So anyway, uh, I don't get quite as excited about eating this one as I do the Japanese knotweed, but you can eat it. The flavor is quite pungent, so you might find it too bitter to tolerate as a raw vegetable. If you boil it for several minutes, that usually tones down the bitterness, and then you might enjoy uh, eating it. There is one part of the plant that I find pretty tolerable raw, and that are the stems on the plants before they bloom. As those stems are quite mild, and you can eat them raw, you could chop them up and use them in a stir fry. All right, here's a related plant called wintercress. And as you're traveling around, in fact, I think if I remember correctly, and you might even know the name of this field, I'm sorry, I'm spacing out on it, but when you break free at the Concord Prison and you're out of the rotary and you're finally en route to in the clear and you're looking off on the left, there's a wonderful field where you see the pumpkins in the fall and uh, in the spring you often see dandelions. Well, now there's another yellow flower there and it's this species, the wintercress. But at that stage, the plant's too, it's too late to eat it. You want to eat that before it blooms, and that's like the beginning of May. You look for it then. And if you see on the plant, you see these little broccoli floret type formations. So that is uh, the part that you can eat like a wild broccoli. And once again, you have to boil it because it's too pungent to enjoy steamed or as raw vegetable. But uh, boil it for several minutes, and the flavor is identical to broccoli raw. All right, anybody know what this plant is? All right, well, I will just tell you, okay? It is uh, called Dame's Rocket. A lot of people think that it's phlox, but any, any phlox flower has five petals. This has just four petals. This is actually another wild mustard, so it's related to the garlic mustard and the uh, wintergrass. So, uh, and you see how it comes in a white and a purpley color together? That's invariably how I see it in the wild, the two colors together. And so, um, uh, although, they both have the same flavor. I tend to just use the purple color because purple is a funner color than white. But anyway, um, Dame's Rocket, th th there are other parts of the plant that are edible, but the only part I eat are the flowers because it's really fun to eat flowers. And, um, and they have a sweet, garlicky, radishy flavor, and they're pretty, so it's very nice food. And this plant's on the invasive species list. So another guilt-free foraging opportunity. All right. so. Um, I'll just tell you, I did not take this photo in Stowe. You probably figured that out with that snow-capped mountain in the background. That is actually Mount Washington. And this is the view that you get talking about running the gauntlet of traffic. This is just after you run in North Conway through all the outlet malls and you break free and you're heading up into Jackson. And there's this uh, uh, viewpoint on the left where you look over to the presidential ranch. But the point of the photo is to talk to you about dandelions. Dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story usually goes something like this, is uh, it's spring and you look out in your backyard and you see a bunch of dandelions blooming there and you say, oh, dandelions, I heard they're edible. I should try them. And so you go out, you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite. It's incredibly bitter and you spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame. 
Because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, when you start seeing whole fields turning yellow with the dandelion flowers, it's really too late to be eating them at that stage. So you want to harvest them before the flowers bloom. And actually, my favorite part are, in fact, the dandelion buds, the unopened flower buds. In fact, when they're tucked into the base of the plant, that's when they're really good. Yes? May I ask a question? Sure. I eat dandelions. Yeah. And I pick them in my yard. Yeah. Hasn't been sprayed. Yeah. Oh. It was going to be a yellow yeah. flower, and it's got like that cottony. Oh, 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 yes. This is before this it blooms. Different? This is before it blooms because it also looks sort of like a dandelion blood after it blooms. It closes up again, and then it produces the blow ball. So this is actually before the flowers bloom. Oh, it yeah. looks like after. After it's that. before you see any yellow flowers whatsoever. Right, right. Look for plants that you can, you'll be able to recognize the plant by the leaves. But you don't have to pull that off? That no. Off. No. Off no. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so those flower buds are among my favorite vegetables, period. They're like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. They're really yummy. <laughs> And what I do to prepare them is just pull them off the plant, get a pot of water out, and just dump them in there and smush them around real good to wash them off. And then get a pot of water boiling on the stove, drop the dandelion buds in, and cook them for 60 seconds. That's it. Then they're done. And you can incorporate them into soups or casseroles or omelets. But before you do anything with them, before you even put any salt or butter on them, just try them plain, and I think you'll be amazed at how good they are. And if you want to eat dandelion leaves, my advice is to gather them at this time. In fact, when I'm picking the buds off the plant, if I see any tender leaves in there with the buds, I just harvest those too and prepare them the same way. All right, violets are edible. There's still a few of these in my yard. And the violet flowers are edible, and the violet leaves are edible. And the violet flowers, you can candy and use them for decorating things, like this black walnut cake. So uh, the, this picture of the flowers is a little out of sequence because you won't see flowers like that until the summer, but this is a plant that's related to dandelions called chicory. And it does have a couple edible parts this time of year. The leaves are edible in the spring and in the fall. In the summer, they get too um, uh, bitter, but in the spring and the fall, they're fine. The flowers are edible. They have virtually no flavor. So why eat them? Because blue is unusual food colors. It's fun to just snip the petals off and add them into a salad just to get that blue color in there. And then the root is probably the most well-known edible part of the plant. You make a drink from it. And this is explained in my book, but basically you roast and, and grind up the roots and then brew beverage from it. And the chicory beverage is amazing how much it tastes like coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory drink the same way. Flavor is very similar. There is one big difference, though. Chicory does not have caffeine in it. So you're one of these people who says, well, what's the point of drinking it? If there's no caffeine in it, then the chicory is just not going to cut it for you. All right, here's chickweed. So this one I just had in my um, uh, salad yesterday for lunch. Um, it's a spring or a fall wild edible. It doesn't like the hot weather. It gets very leggy and stringy. But in the spring or in the fall, it looks like this. And uh, I use it as a sprout substitute in a sandwich or lettuce substitute in a salad. It's very good. OK, daisies are edible. I also had daisy leaves in my salad yesterday. And um, although you can eat any part of the plant, uh, above ground part of the plant, um, the best tasting part of the plant are the leaves before the flowers come out. So you need to be able to recognize the plant before it does that. So I will show you what it looks like. So it looks like that. And um, if you notice, I apologize, they're a little out of focus, that the buds, the flower buds, have a flat top and they have markings on them, which looks like a spokes of a bicycle wheel. So look for that. So what you might want to do is wait till the daisies are blooming later this year, nibble on a leaf, get the idea of what it's like, and then uh, familiarize yourself with the leaf shape. And then next spring, you'll be able to recognize the plants before they bloom when the leaves are tastier. And daisy leaves are so good, I've never bothered to cook them. I just use them raw, like in salads. Are there other kinds of daisies? Yeah, there are. Well, there's the daisy fleabane, yeah. okay, which is a native species. But um, so let me go back to this. You'd only get them mixed up in the blooming stage because daisy fleabane doesn't look like this at all. Yeah. So no worries there. But um, just so you know, so the the way when I'm when I'm leading a foraging walk and we encounter this species, I tell people this is one way to tell this apart from daisy fleabane. So this is the plant that, at least in days of yore, 
Uh, people would play She Loves Me, She Loves Me Not with the pedals till you got your answer at the end. So to play that game with the Daisy Fleed Band, you'd need tweezers because the individual white ray pedals are so skinny, you can't possibly pick one at a time. So if you're seizing, seeing daisy-like flowers that have that, it's not this species. Okay. All right, so here's the pineapple weed that I made that tea from. So I used whole plants because it's still early in the season for this, but the strongest flavor is actually in those flowers, and those flowers never get any petals. That's all they do. And if you pinch those flowers, you get a nice, strong smell like canned pineapple. So it doesn't smell like fresh pineapple. It smells like canned pineapple. And then you just... Um, uh, steep the, the, the flower buds would give you the strongest flavor, but if you, there aren't that many out yet, you can use whole plants, which is what I did to get that drink. So I just steeped it in hot water for a few minutes, just like you'd make a regular infusion from anything. All right, lamb's quarters. This is a really common farm and garden weed. Uh, so um, this is, uh, we're in mid-spring now when you're gonna start to see plants like this or toward the latter part of the spring. And you can use it just like spinach. It's related to spinach. It has more vitamins than spinach. Here's sheep sorrel. So th there's a lot of this in Stowe because you have a lot of acid soil here. And that's an acid soil indicator of that plant. And uh, this one is uh, even closely related to the French sorrel. So you can use this one as a substitute for the French sorrel to make sorrel sauce, sorrel soup, stuff like that. And then you have a completely unrelated plant with a similar flavor called wood sorrel. And uh, in any tender part of this plant you can use, including those things that look like little ears of corn, those are the seed capsules, and they're nice and juicy and succulent and tart. You could eat those too. Now the, the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in this plant and in the sheep sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid, which is not good to eat in huge amounts. Like a big cell bowl full of just this plant, if you ate that, it could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium and it could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you're eating it in moderation, it's perfectly fine, okay? All right, so here are two plants that are hard to tell apart, peppergrass and poor man's pepper. You don't need to tell them apart. They're related plants, they have the exact same flavor. So if you pick one and mistake it for the other, completely fine. The one big difference is the plant on the left actually has a long season of availability. Uh, it will be at that stage in about a month and then it will be that way until a really, really hard frost. So through basically after Thanksgiving, you'll still be able to find it that way. So now the, the main edible part in the peppergrass are the flat, round seed pods. And they're relatively small, but if you're finding lots of these plants, like I was in this picture right here, you can see uh, when you strip the seed pods off, you can gather rather a lot. So, um, yeah, so let me just tell you what's going on in this photo. So a few years ago, another naturalist is leading a program that, where lunch was included down in the Cape. And she had made these roast beef and boar sand sandwiches and the peppergrass was growing right outside the building where she was making the lunch. And so I brought some in. I said, can I add some of this peppergrass to the sandwiches? And she said, great. And they were wonderful that way. All right, so when I make stuff from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. I don't insist that every single ingredient be wild. So when I make that strawberry knotweed pie, for example, I don't have to use yak butter for the shortening. I could use regular sugar, regular butter, that's fine. And then, you know, the knotweed makes it a wild dish. But it is fun to make a salad completely from wild ingredients, although I don't want to deter you in any way from just throwing a few violet flowers into regular salad is fine. But you can be extreme about it and make a salad completely from wild ingredients, which is what this one is. So if you see in there the little yellow flowers are wild mustard flowers, little blue purpley flowers are chicory flowers, and then the green stuff, there's a lot of lamb's quarters, chickweed, um, uh, wood sorrel, sheep sorrel, stuff like that, bulking up the salad. And then the little red berries are partridge berries, and then the orangey tomato-like things are something called ground cherries or hushed tomatoes. So there are the partridge berries, and uh, despite the name, they're not really important wildlife food. And how do we know that? We know that because if you're going through the woods today, for example, and you're seeing a lot of partridge berries, those aren't this year's berries. Those are like seven-month-old berries that are from last growing season. If they were so important to the wildlife, they would have all been eaten up. So the fact that they're mostly still there. There's not a lot of caloric value in these berries. In fact, there's not a lot of flavor in these berries. They have virtually no flavor. So why pick them and eat them? Because they're pretty. So I'll put a few on top of a salad just to add that nice color in there. 
All right, and then here is the husk tomato, strawberry tomato, or ground cherry. And you'll see this sometimes in farmer's markets. Some organic farms are growing this as a crop, and that's fine, but it does grow wild. So the uh, Blue Heron Organic Farm, the one I mentioned to you in Lincoln, uh, uh, I have seen this plant growing in the edge of that field. Uh, and um, this photo is also a little out of sequence because this is a late summer into the fall foraging opportunity. It's not, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like plants in the tomato or eggplant family, which is this is in. It likes the hot weather. So it's not even going to really start to show up until the weather warms up. So anyway, um, you'll see the little round uh, yellow fruit in the upper left hand corner of that photo. So that's the ripe fruit and that's what you want to eat. And it tastes like a sweet cherry tomato. The key thing to remember is you can't actually see that fruit unless you pull the husk off. This is important because there are poisonous lookalikes where you're just seeing yellow tomato-like fruit on a plant, and that's not the husk tomato. Husk tomato, there is a husk covering every single fruit without fail. So remember, if, you, if you're looking at a fruit, then it's not the right thing. You have to pull the husk off to see it. Okay, so here's a plant, if you do any bushwhacking, you know this plant, this is cat briar with uh, some vicious thorns and it's very woody. And what could be edible on that? Well, this time of year, the growing tips of the plant that are coming out of the woody vines are edible and you can just snap them off and eat them. Uh, and they have a tart flavor. So, <coughs> so this is Smilax rotundifolia is the name of this plant. It has a cousin that I like even more. And this is a plant called Smilax herbacea and this is called carrion flower. And that's my wife, Ellen, holding a cluster of them that we gather not far from here. And, um, and so this is a plant that looks like asparagus. You harvest like asparagus. You snap the top part of it off. You prepare it like asparagus. Uh, it tastes like asparagus. It's related to asparagus, which is all great. So why is it called carrion flower? So here we have some that I've steamed and ready to uh, add to an omelet. We're using a Frisbee as a plate here. And uh, anyway. So if you look at the little spherical things, the little flower buds on there, if I would waited like a week or two longer to interact with this plant, it'd be a pretty unple unpleasant experience because then it smells like rotting meat or dirty gym socks. And, uh, and occasionally I'll be leading a walk and the carrion flower will be blooming at the time and I'll challenge people, would you like to smell this flower? And they'll stick their nose up to it and they get whiplash from backing away so much because <laughs> the smell is so uh, uh, nasty. But so anyway, so if you encounter this plant when it's blooming, it, it might not be the nicest experience, but if you eat it before it blooms, it's tasty. All right, so here is burdock. This is the plant where the round burrs get caught in your socks in the fall, and the guy who invented Velcro did got, get the idea from those burrs, by the way. So um, they aren't edible, but most of the rest of the plant is edible. And so this is what it looks like now. Let me, let me uh, um, I'll just back up a second and say that Burdock is a biennial. That means it has a two-year life cycle. So the first year, it's going to eventually look like this with the big rhubarb-like leaves. And you can tell it's not rhubarb because they're white and woolly on the underside, and rhubarb leaves don't have that. So anyway, um, and what the, root, what the plant is doing is sending energy down to this big taproot. And then the plant winters over, and then the second year, it uses up the energy from that taproot to make a flower stalk, and then uh, magenta colored flowers and then the round burrs and then the whole plant dies. That's a life cycle of a burdock. So if you want to eat the root, you want to harvest it between the first and second growing seasons. That's when the max amount of food energy is in there. So uh, this is the beginning of the second year. So it's, the root would still be good on that plant. Unfortunately, you can't just yank on the foliage and get a root out. They will break on you. So you have to dig them up, which is a lot of work and I don't usually bother. And I pretty much guarantee that if you do it, your patience is going to give out before the root does. Is that you'll be digging and digging, and it's, at some point you'll say, ah, oh, the heck with it, and you just slice off what you have with a spade. You might have a length of root about that long. And to eat it, the very simple way to prepare is just wash it off. You don't have to peel it. Slice it into half-inch thick rounds, boil it in salted water till it's tender, and it will taste like a starchy artichoke. But as I said, I'm too lazy to do that. Instead, I wait for the second year's growth, and I'm going for the cylindrical flower stalk that grows in the center of the plant. And I cut that off at ground level and lop the top cluster leaves off, and that's the part that I'm going to eat. So if you look on the left side of the photo there, it took me less than a half an hour to gather all those stalks. Now you do have to peel the very outer layer of a burdock stalk off because it's bitter and stringy, 
But once you do that, unlike the knotweed, these are solid all the way through, so you have a lot of food left over after you prepared them. So this is a plant you could actually fill up on. So you, you just uh, cut them into half inch thick rounds and boil it in salted water till it's tender, which is only about five minutes. And then they're delicious, just plain, or thrown into spaghetti sauce, they're great. Or they're really good in a recipe I'm sure a lot of you have eaten if you haven't made it yourself. It's a recipe where ordinarily you take artichoke hearts and Parmesan cheese and mayonnaise and breadcrumbs and you mix it together and it's a spread that you, you bake it in the oven, it's a spread that you put on crackers. Well, you can substitute the boiled burdock flour stock rounds for the artichoke hearts in that recipe, it works great. That recipe is on my web page, by the way. So the handout that I gave you that you'll pick up later, at the bottom you'll see links to where to find me in the internet, and one of the pages is a recipe page where uh, that recipe right there is going to be on there. Okay, so um, I haven't started talking about mushrooms yet, and the main section on mushrooms in this show is going to be later on in the season because the main mushroom hunting season in New England goes from the 4th of July until Columbus Day, that's when you see the greatest quantity and variety of mushrooms. But there are a couple species that come out in the spring, and morels is one of them. That's the one that uh, will kick your butt when you try to look for them because they're maddeningly elusive in eastern Massachusetts. So, uh, in fact, I don't know if any of you heard Science Friday. The episode last week, they interviewed a, the New York Mushroom Club as they were going morel hunting, and they found some. But the president of the club said, I'm always really happy when morel season is over. Why would he say that? Because it's really hard to find them and you could just exhaust yourself going up and down hill and dale and come back with nothing. And so, but occasionally, serendipitously, you can find them. And, and um, I gave a talk in Danvers yesterday. Wonderful. I gave a talk in Danvers yesterday and one of the people in the, t in the audience had some mushrooms he wanted me to identify and they were morels and so, yeah, so it can happen. Uh, so anyway, so these are the black morels and where I tend to find these is not way off in the wilderness somewhere but usually very close to where people are doing things like putting in plants, managing shrubbery, you know, so it could be like in the pea gravel right by the foundation of a house which is where the, this photo was taken. So all these mushrooms are just around one house in Weston. And you can tell it was taken a while ago because there's a film canister <laughs> in the photo. You know, I'm going to have to explain to young people what that is at some point because they, they'll have no clue. So anyway, so that's the black morel. Then there's also the yellow morel. So the picture on the left was taken in Pepperell, Mass, and that woman, Sue Edwards, was house-sitting a house and found all those morels just around a house she was house-sitting. So where I tend to find yellow morels is um, uh, at the, at around old apple trees or recently dead elm trees where the bark is still attached to the tree and it hasn't sloughed off yet. And, uh, and I have found them in Stowe. So I have to tell you a story about the, how this happened in Stowe. So at the Delaney Project, a place you probably all know, so this is one of the main parking lots where you go in and all the dog walkers go and there's kind of a berm you know, that's above the surrounding territory and you're walking along there and so. So I've got this group, about 16 people were walking along and I look off to the left not long after we started the walk and I see some old tra apple trees and a recently dead elm tree. So I say to somebody, hey, go down there and take a look, see if there are any metal, uh, morels there. So she goes down there and she says, yup. And I said, what do you mean, yup? She said, yeah, they're there. So we all raced down and there were 12 morels there at exactly where they were supposed to be. So. You know, every once in a while it works, but as I say, you know, for every spot like that, there's at least a dozen where there's bupkis, so anyway. So we'll talk more about uh, other mushrooms later. I have one more I want to talk to you about, though, that you might have an easier time finding. So, in fact, I took this photo within like six miles of where we are right now. So I'll give you that hint. Okay, and so this is the wine caps Jeferia. So this is a little bit more challenging in terms of there's a greater risk of poisonous lookalikes to this one, and I'll talk a little bit more about how to avoid that uh, later on in the show. Uh, and the main problem with this one is it's guild mushroom, and guild mushrooms are responsible for 90% of all mushroom fatalities. So some people just say, ah, I think, I think I won't pick guild mushrooms. And by doing that, you're avoiding 90% of the risk of uh, getting seriously ill from eating a mushroom. So anyway, so, but you'll see that this color is smoky gray on the underside where the gills are, and that the ring on the stalk is really wild looking. 
Uh, it's very jagged and it almost looks like teeth are sticking out of it. And then these mushrooms, and it's called wine cap because this is the typical color down here, this like red wine color, although it can get bleached sometime, which is what happened for the mushrooms I just picked. And then the, uh, these mushrooms always grow in wood chips. And so if you're seeing this, what you think this mushroom anywhere else, it's very, very unlikely to be the wine caps, Jeferia. Yeah, not tiny. No, these are huge. In fact, uh, you know, it's, it's unusual to see one that's two inches. Usually they're seven, eight inches. I've seen them like dinner plate size. Yeah, so they can be enormous um, and very prolific. And they can, you know, they're, they're living off, you know, they're, they're basically, their mycelia is in the pile of wood chips and that's what they're living off of. And they'll often recur, you know, in that spot till they've used up all the food. So, all right, we'll talk more about mushrooms later. Okay, so here's the black locust, a tree that is very common here in Eastern Mass. It has one edible part and that's out very soon, so it's not out yet, so this is information you can file away and use very shortly. So the edible part are the flowers and the flowers are great for just stuffing your face right by the tree. You can pick them off their central stems, you can eat them raw, put them into salads. My favorite way to use them though is to make fritters from them and this recipe's in my book. Okay, then pokeweed comes out around the same time. I've already seen the shoots beginning to show. And, um, and the only edible part in a pokeweed plant are the young shoots when they're six to 10 inches tall. And make sure you don't get any of the root because the root has the purgative in it, which is uh, something you don't want to eat because you'd have a nasty experience. So just eat the green part of the plant and you do have to boil it for seven minutes to make it safe to eat. But, um, uh, but the plant will not shrink or get mushy on you even after all that boiling. And yeah, if you see the stalk from last year's pokeweed plant going into the ground at the same spot where the shoots are coming up, then um, that will help you uh, uh, know that it's a pokeweed plant. Oh, wrong way. Okay, there's what you're looking for, the pokeweed shoot. Okay, and milkweed's edible too. It's called a procrastinating forager's dream food because there's at least four edible stages to the plant and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while until the next edible stage develops. So this is edible stage number three, the flower buds when they're in a nice tight green cluster. So I use the same cooking method for this as the pokeweed. Boil it for seven minutes, but um, milkweed could care less that you've done that because those buds on the right side, they've already been boiled for seven minutes and look how well they held up. So uh, you could eat that as a vegetable if you wanted to, or you can incorporate that into different dishes like the milkweed egg puff in the left-hand corner there. That recipe is in my book, and that's a great way to use the milkweed buds. And then even the pods are edible when they're nice and small and nice and firm to the touch. The flavor is very similar to green beans. Once again, boil for seven minutes. So, but the monarch butterfly caterpillars in the photo to remind us that indeed this is the, one of the milkweeds that the butterflies seek out to lay their eggs on and the caterpillars eat the leaves and so on. And uh, so we want to make sure to leave plenty of milkweed plants there so the butterflies have all that they need. And what I'll do as a karmic payback to the milkweeds is that uh, in the fall when the pods split open and the, the parachutes are showing with the seeds attached, if I see a nice healthy patch of milkweed plants, I'll gather some of those seeds. And as I'm traveling around, if I see a good milkweed habitat without any milkweed, I'll just release the parachutes and help start a new colony. Thank you. Did you say fire? Butterflies. 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 Right. come in droves. I have some really great videos of like all of the pollination. That How cool is that? Mm, yeah. Wonderful. All right. So here's some um, sassafras. And this is a fun plant because it has leaves with three different shapes. No thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs all in the same plant, which is great. It has two edible parts, an above ground part and a below the ground part. So let's talk about the below ground part first. So it's the bark on the roots that have a really strong root beer type flavor. And so in my book, I've got a recipe for uh, sassafras candy, which is like the root beer barrels you used to buy at the penny candy store, only even better because there's little bits of root bark embedded in the candy. So they're really good. But in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you that several studies were done about 50 years ago 
where they took an essential oil called saffron, which is in the sassafras root bark, and they fed a large amount of saffron to rats, and some of the rats got cancer. And they said, okay, that's it. Uh, humans should not eat sassafras. And so the Food and Drug Administration banned sassafras from the commercial food supply. So, um, but as far as I know, all those studies did is they showed that if you feed rats a huge amount of saffron, some of them get cancer. I'm not aware of any study that showed any humans getting cancer from eating sassafras. Uh, but having said that, if you decide, hey, I don't care if there's any possibility that this could be carcinogenic to me, I just don't want to mess with it. I totally support you in that. In fact, whatever, wherever you want to draw the line about your risk of, and comfort level, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm not absolutely sure that that's the right plant and you chicken out and don't eat it. I think that's pretty sensible. Uh, and, uh, you know, if a spot you want to pick from, you think, well, you know, I'm not really sure this is a clean area. There's a lot of cars that go by. Maybe not such a great idea to pick something. Fine. You know, you don't have to forage, okay? We've got plenty of other food around. This is just something you do if you feel comfortable in doing it. So I'm just sharing you with what I do, and if you decide you want to do it, that's fine. And, you know, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, Russ, I'm completely uninterested in what you were talking about tonight, but you made it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and so, which is great, but you know, uh, I don't consider it a failure if people go, you know, buying everything wrapped in plastic at the supermarket even after they've had this talk. It's fine. Uh, I'm just telling you this is yummy stuff out there and you can do it or not. It's up to you. Okay, there's another part of the sassafras that's edible and that's the young leaves and this plant is just coming into the stage right now and young sassafras leaves are used to make filet powders. If you've ever heard of filet powder, that's what it is, young dried powdered sassafras leaves. So you can make your own filet powder and just add it to soups and stews at the end to flavor and thicken it. Okay, cattails are edible. There's a whole chapter in my book about them, so I won't go into a lot of detail with them. Uh, the immature bloom spike is edible, so there it is in the right, and if you pull the outer leaves away, that's what you see inside, and you could just steam or boil those up. Uh, till they're tender and eat them. Then the cattail heart, yes? Oh, still uh, a question about the sassafras leaves. Yeah. The, uh, you said that the root is the, as a potential for the saffron. Yeah. Uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is there as much of a risk with uh, there, I, I'm the sorry, leaves? I'm sorry I neglected to answer that. There is no saffron in the leaves. Oh, okay. So it's the, that issue is completely non-existent for the leaves. Cool. Yeah. So right. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, so there's the cattail heart, and, uh, and that's the center of the developing cattail stalk, and that tastes like uh, cucumber or hearts of palm. And then even the cattail pollen is edible. It's hypoallergenic, and you can just wander into the cattail swamp with a, with a bag and just take the blooming plant and bend it into the bag and give it a little shake, and this big cloud of yellow pollen comes off. And keep doing that, and eventually you'll have a cup or more of the pollen and just put it through a fine mesh sieve just to get out any twigs or bugs that might be in there. And then you add the cattail pollen to flour to make these really pretty and nutritious cattail pollen baked products. All right, anybody know what this plant is? Sweet yes, good job, Gordon. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is called Calamus or Sweet Flag, and um, and it looks sort of like cattail and iris and stuff like that. But once I show you the flower, which is very different, uh, then it might help you recognize the plant. So, so that's what the flower looks like in the left photo. There, it looks like a thumb sticking out at an angle from the stem, and uh, this whole plant has a spicy, gingery flavor, and uh, it's actually a little strong. Um, but if you just uh, use the inner leaves as the plant is growing, it's mild enough to put it into a salad or, or something like that, but they're very spicy. Anybody know what this plant is? Really? Okay, I took this photo along the Assabet River. Still don't know, okay. Wild rice grows here, very close by. Uh, but, he, but truth be told, I have to tell you, I have not processed my own wild rice, gathered and processed it. Uh, you know, you have to pick it, big deal. I pick stuff all the time, but then you have to parch it and winnow it. 
to have it be the edible wild rice, and I just haven't gone to all that trouble. But I do know people that do it in New England. Uh, and I've bartered for it where I've given them something I had and I've gotten some locally gathered wild rice in return. Uh, but in general, I am buying my wild rice from the Ojibwe Indian tribe because they're still collecting it in the traditional way in the canoes and the lakes in northern Minnesota where they paddle into the rice fields and when the, when the plants are ripe, they bend the plants over the boat and they whack it with a stick and the ripe grains fall into the boat and they're parching and winnowing hundreds and hundreds of pounds of wild rice. So at that scale, it makes a lot more sense. But you could do it if you wanted to. <laughs> All right, so here is a plant called the linden, or the basswood tree. And we have a, a native version of this, and also an introduced version from Europe. And it's the genus Tilia, and they're usable the exact same way. So you can um, eat the young leaves on these plants, or you can make a tea from the flowers. And the tea from the flowers has a very pleasant flavor, and it also has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your, digest your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. So it's a very highly regarded medicinal tea in Europe for that reason. Okay, this is a photo from earlier this spring when the shad are running in the rivers. One of the earliest plants to bloom is the Juneberry, a genus Amelanchier species, shadbush, serviceberry, Saskatoon, all the same thing. And the fruit is ripe in June, that's why it's called a June berry, and it looks a lot like a blueberry, but it actually tastes more like a cross between a cherry and an almond. And they're great for stuffing your face right by the tree, or you can make stuff from them, uh, from the fresh berries or the dried berries. And mulberries are ripe at the same time, and I will, and mulberries are also great for stuffing your face right by the tree. And I'll mix mulberries and June berries together and make strudel, which is uh, really good. All right, and wild strawberries, uh, you probably all, I hope you all have had the experience of gathering your own wild strawberries. They are exceedingly teeny, but they're also very yummy. And, um, and this is a plant as um, I have been continuing, while I'm continuing to teach these foraging things, I'm also learning how to propagate plants and make them available to organizations like land trusts or cities and towns or state or federal agencies to put out in the landscape and just enhance the edibility of the landscapes. And wild strawberry is one of the plants I'm growing. So I actually have flats where I planted wild strawberry seeds where the itty bitty little plants are just beginning to show. So it's very exciting. So, uh, and anybody that has a lawn, you know, where it's just managed naturally, why not have a w wild strawberries in that lawn? So I plan to do that. All right, so now we're into the summer, and jewelweed is, um, has edible seeds, and the edible seed are in the seed pod. So this thing right here is the seed pod, and in there are some seeds. Uh, but the tricky part is when the seed pods are ripe, they explode. One of the nicknames of this plant is touch me not, because if you brush against the plant when the seed pods are ripe, they detonate. They just go, psh, 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 they shoot all over the place. So if you want to eat those seeds, what you need to do is sneak up on one of those seed pods. <laughs> and grab it and have it explode in your hand. So right over here, this is what a ripe seed pod looks like. So if you gave that one just a little squeeze, it would explode, all right? So what you wanna do is capture the seeds in your hand, open up the hand, and letter D are what the seeds look like, and they taste like walnuts. So not like black walnuts, but like store-bought English walnuts. And another thing you can do with those seeds, and you don't need to do this to, see, to, to eat, but just to see, is if you gently rub the outer covering off to see the inner seed color, it's letter E on here. It's that beautiful, bright robin's egg blue color. And I have no idea why that color's in there, because no creatures ever see it. It's just one of those mysteries of Mother Nature. Okay, so purslane is a really common summer garden weed and farm weed, and um, it's very good for you. It's high in omega-3 fatty acids and iron, and you can eat it raw, you can eat it cooked. And I will give you a tip for how to use purslane that requires no cooking skill whatsoever, and that is to put the purslane leaves in a gazpacho. And you don't even have to make the gazpacho. You can go to the store and buy the gazpacho, and then just throw the purslane leaves in there, and the texture of the purslane leaves works really well in a gazpacho. So here's black raspberry. I don't need, how, I don't need to tell you how to use black raspberry fruit. I'll tell you that one of the best ways to recognize black raspberries during the off-season when you have this these purpley canes. So um, the color doesn't show up that well now in the spring, but earlier in the season, like February, in the middle of the winter, you could be out cross-country skiing or walking your dog and see a bunch of these thorny purpley canes. And that's a black raspberry patch. And remember where that is, and then go back and get it, get the fruit at the end of June into July. All right, here's a plant that I see every once in a great, great while here in the Metro West area. We're gonna see it much more frequently 
is uh, along the shore of Buzzards Bay or the Cape and the Islands or further south and west like Long Island Sound, Lower Hudson Valley, stuff like that. It is an invasive species called wineberries. So it's in this book, Total Guilt Free Foraging Opportunity when you see it. You don't have to hold back at all, pick all you want. And, um, and the fruit is going to be ripe in Massachusetts probably toward the end of July into early August. If you're further south in the range, it will be ripe earlier. So mid-July in the New York City area. So anyway, so one nice thing about this fruit is that you see they ripen in these terminal clusters. So you could just go and get like six fruit all at once. So the picking is faster than red raspberries. And um, although a red raspberry fruit probably has a more interesting flavor than these do. These are very nice, but I think raspberry is tastier. But these are really pretty fruits. And so this is a technique you probably know, but a great way to store fruits like this is to just pick them off the plant and spread a single layer of them on a cookie sheet and stick that into your freezer. And once they're frozen, then you can store them in a plastic bag or container and then pull them out and use them later. And so here is a wineberry flan my wife made from berries that were like 10 months old and see how well they held up even after all that freezing. Okay, so here's a black cherry fruit and the black cherries vary in flavor from tree to tree. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent and other times they can be uh, just about as sweet as a domesticated cherry. So, uh, so if you try them and, and you're not, you don't like them, don't give up on them. They make a wonderful jelly. Yes, they do. Uh, all right, so here is the elderberry plant, and I need to get on my soapbox just one more time about this one because this is another species I've heard a lot of hyperventilating going on about in the foodie world. And it's not the berries, it's the elder flower that they seem really fixated on. And, uh, and I'll just illustrate this with a quick story. So a few years ago, I get an email from a fancy produce store in the Boston area who says, more or less, tell us where the elderberry plants are so we can pick the flowers and make the syrup that we could sell at our store. I wouldn't tell them. I, I told them the kind of habits that the plants like to grow in, but I didn't want to tell them a specific spot because I was too afraid they'd just go hammer it. So here's a scenario. I don't know if this has happened, but I think it's pretty plausible. Um, let's take a chef that's really you know, excited about elderflower and wants to put it on the menu, and he says to somebody at the restaurant, hey, go out there and pick me 10 pounds of elderflower. And this poor schnook is running around, running around, trying to find it. And he finally finds a bush like this with all the elder flowers blooming on there and he looks at that bush and he says, you know, if I pick every flower off this bush, I can fill this order. And now I have time to run around and find other elderberry bushes, I get to get back to the restaurant. So there go all the flowers, which means no flowers left for any pollinators. No fruit is going to form on that plant because you have to leave the flowers on the plant to get the fruit. So that's the kind of impact that could happen if there's this large scale commercially driven harvesting of this native species in its natural habitat. So that's what I get worried about. So I said to this produce store, I wrote them back and I said, you know, there's some really yummy, uh, you know, weeds and invasive species out there. There's this flower called the black locust that is really yummy and there's a ton of it out there. And if you're going to commercialize wild plants, can I point you in that direction? Because if what you're doing goes viral and everybody copies you and everybody's doing the cumulative impact of everybody picking the flowers, it's much less likely to cause a problem if it's a plant like the black locust as opposed to a native species like the elderberry. And they said, no, we want elderflower. And I said, all right, well, in that case, may I suggest that you get a farmer to grow it for you? Because a lot of farms, as you know, they'll have wetlands in the edge of the farm and though the habitat would be too wet to like grow conventional row crops there, but the farm could put in a row of elderberry plants in a habitat like that. And if all the flowers on those plants got stripped off and sold to restaurants, at least they're not harming the wild populations. So here's a couple examples of elder drinks made from the elder flowers. So the one on the left is made in New Zealand where the plants aren't native, so I can't really complain about that. And the St. Germain liqueur, I assume that they're, the elder flowers they're using in that are harvested sustainably, otherwise they'd pick themselves right out of business. Uh, but I just want to use this species, the Sambuca uh, canadensis, just to illustrate the point that I was making earlier at the beginning of the talk where I was talking about how native species often have animals that rely upon them for all or some important portion of the life cycle. So here's the story with the elderberry, this really cool critter called the elderberry borer beetle that spends most of its life 
on or associated with elderberry plants. So the adults mate on the elderberry plants, they lay their eggs on there, the little eggs hatch, the larvae live inside the stems of the elderberry plant, and they're not harming the elderberry plant. The, the, the insect and the plant have co-evolved over eons, they do fine. Um, and, but um, if you know the stripping the flowers from the wild got to be really popular to sell the restaurants and stuff, that wouldn't be killing the beetle directly. But if we began to prevent this plant from reproducing in the wild because we weren't allowing the, the ripe berries to form, and we started losing elderberry plants in the wild, then this beetle's gonna be harmed, all right? So that's why I just get nervous. So I don't wanna deter you in any way from connecting the outdoors through your taste buds. I mean, that's why I give these talks and, and um, and you know, but you're picking at a small scale for just yourself and a couple friends. I'm not worried about that. It's actually blue and yellowish orange, okay. iridescent, the two colors together. If it's, yeah. black, if it's red, then it's not the same. No, right. You probably, you see those in your milkweed plants, the red beetles that look yeah. like this? Yeah, I've seen those too on milkweed it's plants. It's not the same, okay. right. Yes? yes. Are just the berries and the flowers are the animal parts? Yes. No, no, only the, only the flowers and the berries. Okay. And they, I make jelly from them. From the berries. And I tried to make elderflower liqueur last year. Yeah. Failed yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think uh, I, I've heard the term maceration used, which sounds like mastication to me, but it's more or less letting the plant part soak in the water. And that seems to, at least that's what I've seen. But anyway, okay. So if you leave the flowers on the plant, then berries will form like this, and that photo is an upside down. That's what the berry clusters do when they're ripe. They hang down like that. Now, ripe elderberries aren't good to eat big handfuls of them raw because you can get a stomach ache from doing that. But if you dry the berries first to cook them first, then they're safe to eat. All right, spice bush. This is a pretty common plant here in Eastern Mass, native species. This is one of the plants the colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era when they were boycotting the British tea. They would just steep the twigs in hot water for a few minutes. My favorite part to eat on the plant are the red berries and I will dry them and pulverize them and use them as a savory spice like black pepper, Szechuan peppercorns. Um, but these berries are important food for migrating songbirds because they're high in lipids and the birds will seek them out to fuel their southward migration. So it's important to leave lots of berries on the plant so the birds get all they need. And another reason you might want to actually plant a spice bush on your property is they are the host species for these spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. And if you look on the left there and you see those big eyes on the caterpillar, those are fake eyes. The caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake to uh, deter the birds from eating it. Okay, so wintergreen, another common native species. Um, the whole plant, uh, above ground part of the plant has that oil of wintergreen flavor in it. And the berries aren't very sweet, but they have the oil of wintergreen flavor too. Then, also the black or yellow birch that are pretty common around here is just a botanical coincidence. They're not related to the wintergreen plants at all, but they also have oil of wintergreen in the inner bark. And so I will make a tea from this, and this is something you could do year round, so now is fine, tomorrow if you want. And you just take the twigs and you scrape the outer bark off to expose the green inner bark where the flavor is, and take the peelings and the peeled twigs and stuff a mason jar full of them, fill it up with water, and I find if I just let it sit around for a couple hours, it will take on a nice strong wintergreen flavor. Um, so then, all right, so here we have the black huckleberry, and I'm sure a lot of people pick these thinking they're blueberries, and there's actually no harm in, in that. Thoreau wrote about these a lot, um, and uh, he would go huckleberrying as would the townspeople in Concord. And uh, they're a little waterier and seedier than blueberries, but other than that, they're fine. Uh, and then there's a, a cousin called the blue huckleberry, and the nice thing about this fruit is that it's still available in September when you think you've you know, lost all your opportunities to pick blueberry type plants, this one's still out there. All right, anybody know what this plant is? All right, so look at the boardwalk going through the sand. The key. Does that help? Looks like a beach plum. Right, Gordon, very good. Yes, this is a beach plum. This might be the most valuable piece of information you're gonna get in the entire show. The best time to spot beach plums is this month when they're blooming, because they stand out really well in the landscape, because when the fruit is ripe toward the end of August into September, come on, 
It's purple and it's hard color to see at a distance. In fact, you have to be standing practically right next to a beach plum to see if there's fruit on there. And so it's better if you actually know where the plants are and then you can go and get them. Um, and beach plums, the fruit gets about as big as a sweet cherry, a Bing cherry. And uh, so they're never like a commercial conventional plum. But, and they will vary in flavor from bush to bush. They can be a little astringent and kind of tart. But I've also had beach plums that are wonderful for just stuffing your face right from the, the plant. So last two weeks of August through most of September is the, the time to look for them. And I have seen them growing inland further west than here. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled. So what I did basically, and this is um, a skill that you'll develop if you, you know, do foraging um, like me and you, you pour some uh, attention into it. I was traveling, you know, in the spring in Worcester County and in this time of year and I saw some bushes that looked like that. And I thought, boy, those look like beach plums. I should remember to check them in early September. And I did, and they were beach plums. And, you know, so this picture, come on, come back. That picture was taken uh, west of here. All right. And, and they by water or? No. Um, Beach plums will grow in a sandy, well-drained location. They don't have to be near water at all. Yeah, sunny. They like sun. Make sure you have that. Okay, so I was telling you that I'm concerned when chefs start putting wild plants on menus, but this is one I wish they put more on the menu. This is an invasive species called Codium, and it is bad news ecologically, and I've actually been trying to promote chefs to use this one. Uh, I was on Martha's Vineyard a couple years ago and I was trying to suggest this idea for a codium cook-off to have all the chefs in the vineyard start experimenting with this seaweed and see what different recipes they could come up with it. And if they could, uh, you know, figure out some really good ways to use it and start putting it on the menu and it got popular and people were starting to eat it, that'd be great because the more this is picked, the better off the environment is. What does it taste like? Um, well, my wife doesn't particularly like it because she thinks it tastes like fleece, like you're eating like a fleece jacket, you know, <laughs> that has that texture, a little furry, you know, but uh, I've eaten it raw, I've eaten it cooked, and it tastes fine to me. The Koreans make kimchi from it, and so I think it's worthy of experimentation. So if any of you, pickle it, yeah. yeah, pickle it, right. So if any of you uh, see it, what's that? It has a good look. Yeah, right, right. It's very distinctive looking. And especially south of Boston, uh, it's, it's very abundant. So you should be able to find it without any problem. So speaking of areas like that, this is the beach rose. Um, and, uh, uh, but any rose is edible, and it's the petals and the hips, and the hips are just the fruit of any rose wild or domesticated. So there's rose hips for a couple species. That's the beach rose on the right. And um, those ones on the right there, the flavor of a good beach rose tastes like a cross between an orange and apple and a strawberry. They're really yummy. Okay, so we finally got to the mushroom portion of the show. So, um, so let me start with the bad news, okay? There are a few species of mushrooms that could potentially kill you. Not a lot, but they're out there. And unfortunately, there's nothing from the way they look or their taste that gives you any indication there's anything to worry about. So you could have a delicious mushroom meal, be dead several days later from liver or kidney failure. So that's the bad news. The good news is you can arrange all the mushroom species there are in a line and cluster to one end of those species that are virtually impossible to confuse with anything poisonous versus those at the other end of the line that even the experts can't tell apart. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out as you gain experience and confidence, that's how you stay out of trouble. Everybody get that? Okay, so. So the sulfur shelf mushroom, or the chicken mushroom, this one right here, is way at the safe end of the line. It doesn't have any poisonous lookalikes. The only lookalike it has is an edible lookalike. I'll get to that in just a second. So what are we looking at here? So the top uh, color of the mushroom, the upper shelf, is um, a pumpkin orange color. And then the underside is the yellow color, and it's like bright yellow chemistry class sulfur type yellow. And you see how it grows on layers directly on wood, so it could be a tree or a stump or a log, um, or it can be a living tree. Uh, and, um, and you'll see on the underside of the fronds sticking out, there's no gills on here. So this is what's called a polypore mushroom. And, um, 
And so uh, if you're seeing a mushroom with all that, that is the sulfur shelf mushroom. And the reason it's called a chicken mushroom is because if you pull the meat apart on one of these mushrooms and you look at the inner texture of the meat, it looks exactly like the breast meat of a chicken. So, uh, so they're good. And uh, here's the cousin of it. So this is um, a cousin where instead of that sulfur yellow color, you're going to get a pink or sometimes a white color. But this mushroom is at least as tasty as the uh, orange and yellow one. Okay, the French have a name for this mushroom. They call it trompette de mort, which means trumpets of death. But that's only because it's black. It's actually a delicious mushroom with no poisons look alike. It's called the black trumpet chanterelle. And these can be very common around here under the right conditions. So usually from midsummer into early September is when I'll see them. And, um, and the tricky part is seeing the first one because they're very small. They're only about two or three inches tall and they're black. But once you see the first one, just stop in your tracks and look around, and you're very likely to see dozens, sometimes hundreds of them. There's and no, no gills, okay. right. And, um, and these mushrooms dry really well, and that concentrates the flavor. So if, you, if you're lucky and you're finding more than you can use right away, you can dry them and keep them in your pantry and use them uh, anytime they're later. The oh, they're growing directly on the ground. And where I often see them is an association with beech trees, usually with hardwoods, and usually some kind of a damp depression in the woods, like, for example, a vernal pool that's dried up. I often see them in a place like that. Okay. All right, this is called the sweet tooth of the hedgehog mushroom. And in case you can't see on the left side, when you flip the mushroom upside down, the cap has these teeth hanging down like the uh, roof of a cave. And so there are no poisonous tooth mushrooms. There are some that don't taste good, but nothing that would make you sick. And this one, the cap has a, a flesh color. Occasionally it's a little bit more yellow, and it has sort of a felty feel to it. And these I usually see under hemlocks, and I have found them within 10 miles of where we are right now. Okay, so the only mushroom that's a lookalike to the mushroom in that photo, or the only lookalike to the mushroom in that photo is a volleyball. That's actually a giant puffball mushroom. And that isn't even a particularly large one. They can get to be more than twice that big. And, um, and so those are edible as long as they're nice and firm to the touch. And when you slice into them, they're white in the inside. They don't want to be uh, yellow or green or any other color. And the standard way to cook those is to slice them in half inch thick steaks and roll them into a beaten egg and then into some seasoned cracker crumbs or bread crumbs and fry them in a skillet and a little butter and make country fried puffball steaks. And that one mushroom can easily feed everybody in that photo. All right, so this is a Boletus edulis mushroom, which is in the Bolete family of mushrooms, which is at the safer end of the line. There aren't any deadly poisonous species of Boletes, uh, with one very minor exception. There are a few that could give you a stomach ache, but most of them either don't taste good or they taste good or they taste really good, like this one, the porcini mushroom. And, uh, and these do grow in Eastern Mass, and uh, I don't find them every year, but I find them most years. And you can occasionally see them right at the beginning of the summer, but usually the main time I'm seeing them is toward the end of September into October up till about Columbus Day. And okay, so I'm going to teach you how to distinguish the Boletus edgeless. What you want to look for is the top of the cap is the same color as a loaf of baked bread. And then uh, you'll see in the left basket over there, you see in the underside of one of the caps, you'll see a yellow green color, an olive green color. That's the color of the spongy layer on the mature Boletus edgeless. When they're young, they're white like this one. But the key distinguishing feature of the Boletus edgeless is up near the top of the stalk, you're going to see a net-like marking, which is called a reticulation. It almost looks like somebody took some fine gauze and wrap the top of the stalk with it. And the key thing is it's white because the look-alike that this mushroom is often confused for has a brown reticulation and a pink uh, spongy layer. And that's the Tilopolis bellius, the bitter boli, which is not poisonous, it just tastes bad. So, uh, okay, so I hope you find some of the porcini mushrooms. All right, here's a really cool mushroom with no look-alikes other than a piece of meat. It literally looks like a piece of meat hanging on a tree, the beefsteak mushroom. And when you cut into it, you'll see it has marbling like a piece of meat. When you squeeze it, red juice comes out like a piece of meat. And so one of my favorite ways to cook it is just brush it with a little teriyaki sauce and grill it on a hibachi like a piece of meat. 
Okay, so this photo was taken a long time ago when my girlfriend, then Ellen, and I were found this uh, mushroom called a cauliflower mushroom, but you look for these at the base of pine trees around Labor Day. And it looks like a big mass of yellowy egg noodles. So here is same mushroom species many years later. Um, and um, so just look for mass of yellowy egg noodles at the base of a pine tree. And when you cook it up, it tastes like a mushroomy egg noodles. It's really good. Here's a bear's head tooth mushroom, and look for these on beech trees, and it looks like a little frozen white waterfall hanging on a tree. And, um, and the texture of these is really similar to crab meat, and so uh, uh, they're very good. So this is probably the most bizarre organism in this show. So this photo was taken at um, Great Brook Farm State Park when I was leading a foraging walk there many years ago. You see, I'm very excited to have found corn smut. And corn smut is a bizarre looking organism. So here's a close up uh, where this fungus gets into the developing ears of corn and it swells up the little kernels and turns them gray. And I'll admit it's not the most appetizing thing I ever thought about eating. Uh, but uh, you can see I'm very excited in the photo here because I know that this, plant, this uh, um, corn smut is considered a delicacy in Mexico. In fact, I've heard that during the A's, days of the Aztecs, that if you were a peasant and you found this growing on your corn, you weren't even allowed to touch it. You'd have to send for an emissary, the emperor, to collect it, and they'd take it off to the royal courts and only the royalty could eat it. And I thought, all right, it must be good then. So I brought it home and I cooked it up, you know, just sliced it up and I cooked it in a little butter, a little onion. And I took one bite and it tasted like mud. And I thought, what is the big deal about this stuff? And then I thought, all right, I'll try it one more time. And I cooked it in a Mexican style with some poblano chiles. And there's some kind of chemical transformation that happens with the capsaicin and the hot peppers that makes the corn smut taste good. So that's the advice I'd give you if you uh, try to eat it. OK, so here's the hen of the woods mushroom. And these uh, I see just about every year, usually from mid-September through Columbus Day is the time I'm looking for them. And uh, they tend to occur at the base of red or oak tree or black oak trees. And the older and bigger the tree is, the more likely you're going to find them. And it's not unusual to find two or even like five or six around a nice old tree. So my wife and I had help picking these, but it wouldn't be that unusual for two people to be able to find that many if you get into the right habitat. So now on these big specimens that are like 18 inches across, the most uh, digestible mushroom meat is going to be that outer layer, so you just trim that bit off because the core of an older mushroom is going to start to get a little tough. Uh, so actually, I like to harvest the hen of the woods mushrooms at what I would call the chick stage, when they're still young and developing. So this one's only about five or six inches across, but the entire mushroom, including the core of it, is very soft and tender and very mild flavored. So that's uh, my preference. How fast do they typically grow? Like how fast from that to that? Yeah. Like, well, if I give it another day. Yeah, these grow slower than that. Okay. So, so, like, uh, th if you give it a day, I'm not fine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, all right. So, it's, it's going to be about this big, probably about um, a week or maybe eight or nine days after it starts. Okay, okay? and then it will probably take another week to be that big, like the ones in those photos. So yeah, so it's up to you um, when you want to get it. OK, so I've got about 15 minutes more plants, and then we'll be all done. And I can take questions, and I've got more stuff to feed you up here. All right, so um, if you've ever seen a sumac like that and said, oh, that must be poison sumac, you are wrong, because poison sumac has drooping clusters of greenish white berries. So any, ber any sumac with red berries is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So this particular kind is staghorn sumac. And the main edible part on a sumac are the berries. It's actually flavoring on the berries. You want to get off the berries into a drink. And so drink's very easy to make. This is described in my book, but I'll just tell you quickly how to do it. So pick the berries off the plant and just put them in a bucket of water. And you're basically kneading them like bread dough and rubbing the flavor off the berries into the liquid. And the water will turn this pink or pinkish orange color. Then just strain it, and then uh, you can drink it hot or cold, sweet or unsweetened, and there's your sumac aid. And the entire time it takes from picking the berries off the plant to drinking the drink is usually less than a half an hour. 
Okay, wild grapes, they definitely grow in this area, and, um, and you often smell them before you see them, and then you just follow your nose to the vine, and you find the ripe grapes, and you stuff your face by the vine, which is a lot of fun. And uh, you can make stuff from those grapes. I'm, you know, I've got baskets like that of ripe grapes in my car in September. That's a pretty common sight. And uh, you know, grape cheesecake is one of the yummy things you can make from them. Then we have another species called the riverside grape, which also produces edible grapes that are smaller, ripen later, and they have kind of a musky flavor. Uh, so they're not that good to eat raw. You could still make jam or jelly from them. But, um, but some people prefer this species to make the stuffed grape leaves recipe because the leaves are tender and smooth and green on the underside, and so they require very little processing. So I find I just have to blanch these for 20 seconds, and then they're fine to stuff them. Um, but you can make stuffed grape leaves from any variety of grape. It doesn't have to be this one. And there they are. OK, so hazelnuts. We have two species of hazelnuts that grow in Massachusetts. They're both equally edible. This is the common hazelnut. And you see in the upper left-hand corner, that's what the husk looks like. It's about an inch in diameter, about uh, sort of looks like a, a head of cabbage. And then the two halves of it open up. And then you can see in the lower right hand are the, the little nuts peeking through. And then eventually those nuts will fall out of those husks. But you don't want to wait that long. Because if you wait for the nuts to fall out of the husks, you will never find them. The squirrels and chipmunks will get all of them, and you'll get none. <laughs> so what I will do is pick the nuts directly off the shrubby hazelnut bushes before they're completely ripe, as close as I can before they're completely ripe. And that, and that date is usually the second week of September. So I'm picking the wild grapes and the hazelnuts basically in the same spot at the same time, because they like the same habitat. And um, uh, OK, so that's the hazelnuts. And um, then we have this one called the beaked hazelnut, where you have the nut developing in the round part, and you have this strange thing sticking out that looks like a bird's beak. That also grows in Massachusetts. OK, so here is a, a photo just explained to you about the two different types of oak trees that we have. But, all oak trees produce acorns, and all acorns are edible. The issue is how much you have to process them to make them yummy. Because most acorns will have enough tannic acid or tannins in the acorn nut meat to make it unpalatable, and you have to tone that down. And there's a way of doing it through a hot water, through repeated boilings. You can also do it with cold water. It takes longer, but that's an alternative method. But in general, it's the acorn species from the oak trees that have the rounded lobes and the leaves, like this white oak acorn that will have lower levels of tannic acid. Uh, but, but you know, in some places, like in northern New England, they like to collect the red oak acorn because that's what they have. So uh, anyway, they're both usable. All right, so here is the shagbark hickory. This is my favorite edible species of all of them, of the more than 150 that occur in New England. I love to find it. I love to gather it. I love to process it and eat it raw, cook with it. It's really fun. And I have some for you to taste. So when I'm done with my talk, I'll give you some to taste. So you see how the bark is shaggy there in the uh, left part of that photo? That's not a seasonal phenomenon. and It's like that all the time. So year round, I've got my eyes peeled for shagbark hickory trees. And I've got the old-fashioned, you know, printed road atlases in my car. And if I'm driving around and I see a bunch of hickory trees, I pull over and I get that road atlas out. And I mark that spot where those trees are. And I know where there are hundreds of hickory trees in Massachusetts. And I just start checking them from mid-September through the end of October. And I gather thousands of these nuts every year. I like them so much. And uh, so besides eating them, I'm also growing them into new hickory trees and I'm going to be getting those out in the landscape so that there's more hickory trees for us all to enjoy. So anyway, um, so there's a close-up of what they look like. And you know, once again, baskets of hickories um, show up in my car uh, in the fall. And there's my maple hickory nut pie. This recipe is in my book that's our New England version of a pecan pie. And virtually everybody I feed this to prefer it over pecan pie. It's really good. So that's a good way to use the hickory nuts. Here's three different cookies I make from hickory nuts. And on the left side, you'll see the barberry jelly, the thumbprint cookies. I'll talk about barberry in a second. Yes? Is the, uh, is the bark able to be used for something like, um, if you were to do uh, like hickory smoked bacon or something like that? Yeah. Are you able to use uh, bark from the shag bark? Yeah. Uh, I mean, hickory, hickory smoke, it's, I think it's made from the wood. 
So I think they're sort of making a charcoal from the wood and having the smoke from that, you know, flavor it. But yeah, um, in my book I talk about, there's this company in Indiana that makes a hickory syrup because allegedly, although I've never done it, you can tap a hickory and get sap out like you can a maple tree. And so I saw this hickory syrup and I read the label correctly, uh, uh, carefully, and it turned out that they were using sugar syrup and they were boiling pieces of the bark of the tree in the sugar syrup to make this hickory flavored syrup. And I tasted it, and it was revolting. It tasted like the water from a Vicks vapor rub. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. And so uh, I'll stick to maple syrup. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so here's three great ways to use uh, uh, hickory nuts and cookies. And I think at least one of those recipes is on my webpage. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the barberry. So outside the library here, there's a barberry bush, but it's not this species. There's two species that you run into in general, and they do hybridize sometimes. But there's the Thunbergii, which is the one outside the library, which is not edible. The Japanese barberry is not edible. It's not poisonous, it just doesn't taste good. And this is the edible one, which does occur in Stowe and in the communities around Stowe. And you want to look for a barberry where the flowers and the berries are hanging down of clusters of 12 or more per cluster. So that's what they look like when they're blooming. And this is happening right now, by the way. And uh, that's what the berries will look like in the fall uh, of the edible common barberry. So that's what I make the jelly from, and it's one of the best jellies there is. So look for berries like that in end of October into November. All right, so here's the black walnut. So this is the same photo that's on the handouts I gave you. And uh, you don't have to pick these off the tree. You can wait till they hit the ground, and then you can start gathering them. And black walnuts have a, sp a spicy smelling and sort of a messy husk on the outside of the nut, and you have to get that off. And it is a messy chore. There's no getting around that. Uh, once you do that, then you have nuts that look like this, and you crack those open to get the nut meat. And then um, uh, I don't. I do have some black walnuts for you to try up here, and you'll see that the flavor is really different from your standard store-bought black walnut, uh, black, standard store-bought walnut. And here are two things that I make from black walnut. So I gave you the recipe on the left, the baklava, and I made for you the recipe on the right, the black walnut honey squares. So that's waiting for you in just a few minutes. Okay, here's a plant called the ground nut, and the edible part is actually not a nut. It's a tuber, whoops, tuber right there on the right side of the photo. And, um, and my favorite way to cook them is just to slice them thinly and fry them in a little vegetable and make groundnut chips. Then we have the Jerusalem artichoke, and it looks like this in September when it's blooming. And now the plants are about six to inches to a foot tall, and they're just leafing out, and they look a lot like a sunflower because they're actually related to sunflowers. But the main edible part are the tubers, and there's the golf ball for scales, so they can come with a mauve color on the outside or a beige color, and they're edible either way, and you could use them most ways. You use potatoes, you can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. All right, here is the autumn olive. So this is what it looks like now. The bushes that are out in the landscape are blooming like this, and that's my wife sniffing the flowers because it has a very sweet, uh, very nice smell. Is anybody here familiar with a native species called the sweet pepper bush? Okay, so this is a plant that likes to grow in swamps. In fact, it's, there, there's a, you know, a list of plants that are associated with wetlands, and the sweet pepper bush is on the obligate list. It on, you only see it in wetlands. And it has the same smell as the autumn olive, but they don't bloom at the same time. And so if you're getting a smell and you say, boy, this smells like sweet pepper bush, it's probably the autumn olive. So nice smell. There's a close-up of the flowers. And there's the fruit again. And so the fruit grows so prolifically on the branches, the branches often hang down from the weight of the fruit. And so I'll just position a basket like this under the bush, and I'll just use milking motions to get hundreds of fruit to fill up the basket really quickly. And then I just bring the fruit home, and I get out a big pot like a lobster pot, and I put just enough water in the bottom of the pot to keep the fruit from scorching like a half an inch. I dump the autumn olive fruit in there. I simmer it for a while to just soften up the fruit. Then I put everything through a food mill, or you could use a sieve if you don't have a food mill. And all the seeds are held back, and the pulp and the juice goes through, and you end up with this frothy mauve-colored puree, which I pour into trays in a food dehydrator, and I let it run overnight. And what I get is what you ate. That's it. So there's nothing added to that. No sugar, no lemon juice. It's just 100% wild fruit pulp. All right. So there's a close-up of the berries. 
And there's the uh, fruit leather on the left side. So besides tasting good, there's vitamin C in that. And also the USDA did a study in the autumn olive fruit pulp a few years back, and they discovered that it's up to 18 times higher in lycopene than tomatoes. Wow. All right, so anyway. So invasive species, guilt-free foraging opportunity. Uh, pick all you want. Okay, so here's the last slide in the show. This documents a really successful foraging day I had in Worcester County about a decade ago. So I'll tell you what's in the photo. It's in the lower right-hand corner. There's some wild pears there. And then the lower left, there's some shagbark kickery nuts. There's a big basket of autumn olive fruit there. Uh, the mushrooms in the basket next to it are the porcini mushrooms. I found a bunch of those. And then down below the autumn olive, you see a mushroom with uh, chocolate-colored gills. That is a horse mushroom, Agaricus arvensis, which is a wild cousin of the standard store-bought mushroom, and it's very good too. You're probably wondering what the barbecue grill is doing in the photo. Well, someone had put one of those out with their trash, and I needed one of those too, so I just foraged for that <laughs> while I was foraging for everything else. So thank you awesome. very much. That's the show. Um, thank you. So uh, I did mention this book, and if you wanted to get one, I do have some with me, and they cost 15 bucks. And as I said, I give all the money to the land trust that published it. Uh, and I just told them, buy more land with it, just create more foraging opportunities for all of us. Find a place to sit though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll squeeze in. We can stand. Give you this last oh, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I won't swig it all yeah. over the place. <laughs> all right, so since we have such an intimate gathering here today, there's no point on waiting to start eating the food and drinking the drink I brought. Awesome. So, all right, so and it is supper time, although I didn't bring you a full course meal. So anyway. I've made you some black walnut honey squares, so that's what's in the little container here, so please come up and help yourself. And then I also have some pineapple wheat tea, which is a plant that's just coming into season now. And so we'll drink it iced. And you will see it's not related to pineapple at all, it's actually related to chamomile. And so it will taste like chamomile tea with a slight um, aftertaste of pineapple. So let's have that too. So there's the cups for the tea. All right, 
three squares, they are They're acceptable. They're right. What no, part? No. Where, where are they made out of? Black walnut. Uh huh. Um. Yeah, a little out of season. So I take it that this is scheduled slightly earlier than some of the talks that happened in this library. And I think that was a favor to me because I have so much I want to talk to you about. I wanted the maximum amount of time so that they wouldn't, you know, want to throw us out of here uh, before everything is ready. Alright, so I'm going to get started and then um, if other people come, so much the better. So let's just make sure you're happy with uh, how I'm coming across. Good. Alright, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Russ Cohen. I'm from the town of Arlington, Mass. I grew up in the town of Weston, Mass, not far from here. Sort of a similar deal to Stowe. In fact, when I moved to Weston in 1964, it was like Stowe is now. Not anymore, unfortunately, but you know. So coming back here this afternoon, you know, gave me a very familiar feel, and you know, my stress level started going down. So it's very, very great to, to have a little time with you out here in the Bucolic Burbs. So anyway, uh, so um, I uh, have been connecting people to the outdoors with their taste buds since I was in high school. So that, uh, my senior of high school, I taught other high school students how to forage, and that was in 1974. So, uh, so that's, uh, what, 42 years ago, and I'm still at it, and I do about 40 programs a year, all over New England and upstate New York, um, connecting people to the outdoors uh, by nibbling on it in a safe and environmentally responsible way. So that's what the talk is about tonight. Hi. Hi. There's handouts and of the, the legible and the edible kind up here. So let's uh, expose another layer of these black walnut honey squares. And then we also have, how is the tea? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. excellent. So that's a pretty common plant. We'll see that in the show in just a second. Let's make sure this works. Great, okay. So anyway, um, uh, I'm going to talk about a few plants that I don't know of a spot in stone where they grow, but most of the stuff grows near here. And there are a few things that are of, um, you know, more of a coastal vintage, but I trust that you get to the coast from time to time. So perhaps you run into these plants there. All right. So, um, before I get into specific plants, and let me tell you, the plants are organized chronologically from the beginning of the foraging season, which starts in April and goes through November. That's the main time when I'm out gathering things. And, um, uh, and for me, foraging is a great way to enrich all the time I spend outdoors, whether it's out here, uh, north and west of Boston, or uh, even in downtown Boston, where I used to work, there's foraging opportunities in the parks in downtown Boston. And of course, along the seacoast, as I mentioned, in the mountains, there's edible wild plants all over the place. So it's really fun to know this stuff. Even if you're not actively hunting and gathering, just to see this stuff as you're walking along the trail, it's like having old friends come and greet you as you're walking along. So that's why I do it. In case you're wondering, I'm not a vegetarian. I'm actually pretty omnivorous. I actually have a relatively conventional diet as I go to supermarkets and restaurants and I also patronize farm stands and farmers markets and I grow lots of fruits and vegetables at home. In addition to all that, there's at least 70 species of wild things that I'm eating too, but I look at it as a fun complement to conventional diet rather than a substitute for regular food. <coughs> all right, so um, 
I do, though, espouse conservation ethics while not foraging, and I encourage you all to do that, too, especially when native species are involved, because these are plants that often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food as some other important portion of their life cycle, so uh, you wouldn't want to pick so much of a native species that you could upset the ecological balance in any way, so I encourage you to do that. And I'll get into more specifics as we go through the show. Um, but having said that, uh, the other end of the spectrum, there are plants that you might be interested in that are on another list, a more notorious list, and that's the state invasive species list. So here's a book the state put out uh, about 10 years ago that's intended to educate people about the 66 what are considered to be the most ecologically disruptive non-native exotic species that occur in Massachusetts. So the species in this book are definitely bad news ecologically, but if there's a silver lining to the cloud of these invasives, perhaps it's a fact for some of these species, they're edible. In fact, out of the 66 species covered in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. As far as these most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of them as we totally could. <laughs> I'm totally serious about that. It's guilt free foraging. You can't pick too many of them, provided that you're not spreading them around in the process, but that is easily avoidable. All right, so I want to give you a chance to try and invasive species right away, and it's this plant that I had up there. So this is a plant called autumn olive. A lot of people call it Russian olive. Yeah, that's oh, an invasive like it, yeah. species. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, now, uh, if you don't know where this plant grows in Stowe, and it's blooming right now, and I will show you photos of the flowers, and they have a very nice smell. So it's conspicuous in the landscape now. But all you have to do is head west toward 495, and it's like lining both sides of the road and in any of the exits and in the gravel pits and in the land, old apple orchards and throughout that area, because the Mass Highway Department planted it. <laughs> thousands of plants before they knew it was invasive, so uh, to their regret. But anyway, but my attitude about invasives is that if the ecologists remove them, fine, but in the meantime, if they're out in their landscape and they're yummy, I'm gonna pick them up and tell other people how to pick them too. All right, so what I do with this plant is when the fruit is ripe, so this photo I took in October, so that's when I'm picking it, and I'll give you more details about that later. But what I do is I pick the fruit, I puree it, and I dehydrate it, and I make a fruit leather from it, which is what is in this container. So please, take a piece. So um, let me talk about one other conservation issue before I plunge into the show, and that is, um, What's the impact on wildlife by foraging? Are you stealing food out of the mouths of deserving animals by going out there and picking it before they do? Well, first of all, if you're showing some restraint and some forbearance on the native species and leaving plenty behind it after you harvest, you're leaving plenty behind for the animals too. But for those of you that remain concerned about this, it might help you to know there isn't 100% overlap between what people can eat and what animals can eat because our taste buds and our digestive systems are different. So for example, poison ivy. A lot of bird species eat poison ivy berries, deer browse and poison ivy leaves, and they can have all the poison ivy they want. We're not gonna compete with them over that. But then I'll be leading a, a program outside doing one of my walks, and someone in the group, group will say, Russ, I was in my yard the other day, and I saw a mushroom with an animal bite taken out of it. That means I can eat it, right? The answer is no, at least not necessarily, because as I said, number one, there isn't 100% overlap between what people can eat, what animals can eat, Number two, you don't know what happened to that animal after turning <laughs> It might have died a horrible death. So animals can make mistakes too, so you can't count on that. All right, so where do you go and pick stuff? That's the last topic before I plunge into the show here. So, well, first of all, let me tell you where I don't go to pick stuff. I don't go to pick along heavily traveled roadways like Route 2. I don't go to places where everybody takes their dog for a walk, although if something is growing above a certain height, even the Great Danes can't reach it. Don't worry too much about that. And um, you know, there's no magic formula about this. Just use your common sense. So if um, the plants that you want to pick from don't look healthy, they look spotted or wilted or stunted, it's possible that they were sprayed with herbicides or that they're picking up some contaminants in the soil that you don't want to be eating. So uh, I would just give those a pass and just wait till something looks better. Um, and uh, so where do I go? So I'll give you a couple specific examples, then a generic example. Okay, one uh, specific example, and it doesn't apply immediately to here, but it's uh, you know within an hour of where we are right now. So 
Here's my foraging book, and this was published by Land Trust, and it's the Essex County Greenbelt Association. This is the Land Trust that covers Essex County, Mass., which is Northeast Mass., the area from Lynn, Marblehead, Salem, uh, Rockport, Gloucester, all the way up to Newburyport and west to Lawrence and south from there. And Greenbelt allows foraging as a permitted activity on all their properties that are open to the public. So you can just go to their website, ecga.org, and just pull up their trail maps and go to one of their properties and start nibbling. It's as simple as that. Then also, uh, the state uh, Department of Fish and Game, which I used to work for, they have a division of fisheries and wildlife, and they manage what are called wildlife management areas, WMAs. And they allow uh, nut gathering, berry picking, and um, what's the other one? Fruit berry picking, nut gathering, oh, and mushroom honey. Uh, on those properties as long as it's from personal consumption only. So you can't give it to a farmer who's going to sell it at the farmer's market. You can't give it to a chef who's going to put it on the menu. It's all commercial use. But if you're picking it just for yourself, you can have a couple friends over, that's fine, but, but no commercial use, okay? And then the third piece of advice I have, and this has perhaps more direct applicability in Stowe, is to forage at organic farms. And I want to say in the very same breath, I don't mean to deter you in any way from patronizing the farm stand and getting a CSA share, if that might work for you. As many edible weeds and invasive species we have out there, you're going to see a lot in the show, it's not enough to make a significant dent in the food that we need. So it's important to support local farming. Organic farming is a great way to go. So I encourage you to do that. But in addition, this great foraging at organic farms. So why is that? Well, reason number one is the obvious one. They're not slathering everything with chemicals. Reason number two is that um, the way that they manage weeds on organic farms is they do it strategically. They're not picking up every single weed constantly every single day. They weed the areas where, you know, they've got the young vegetables just growing up that could be out competed by the weeds and stuff like that. But once they've pulled the spinach out or the peas out, whatever, and they haven't replanted that area, they're not going to weed it. And so if you visited a, a organic farm at the right time and you find patches like that, you can find huge amounts of weeds, enough to feed whole armies. So if I've got a di big dinner party planned and I need lots of raw material, I'll go to an organic farm and find all I need that way. Then the third reason is the wonderful living soil that makes the organically grown vegetables so nutritious to eat. All that great stuff is getting into the weeds too. So the weeds you harvest at organic farms are gonna be particularly nutritious to eat. And then the fourth reason is that the um, edges of organic farms often have good edge habitats where there's fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes on the edge of the field. So my advice is to form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds, you want the weeds, so potentially it's this great partnership. Don't just go there and start picking. Talk to the managers first, but usually they're fine with it. In fact, I get invited to a lot to give foraging talks at a lot of organic farms, so I think they see the synergy there. And one of those farms, by the way, it's right on Route 117, a road you're familiar with. It's in Lincoln, so heading toward Waltham. And it's called Blue Heron Organic Farm, and it's just past Drumlin Farm on the opposite side of the street, just after you cross the railroad tracks. So there's a farm stand there, and when that farm stand is open and the farmer, Ellery Kimball, is there, she said it's fine if people come and pick her weeds. Okay? All right, so let me get into the show. Feel, we've got a nice uh, small group here tonight, so feel free to barge in with any questions. All right. Okay, what is this plant? Fiddlehead. All right, but which species is Ostrich it? Fern. Ostrich fern. Very good. So that turns out to be important because not all ferns are edible. In fact, a really common mistake by people in Eastern Mass is in the spring you're walking through the woods and you see a bunch of ferns at that curled up fiddlehead stage and you say, oh, fiddleheads, it must be the same thing I've seen for sale in the stores. And so you pick it and you bring it home, you cook it up and you take a bite and it tastes horrible and you say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where you went wrong is you harvest the wrong species of fern. I only know of two species that taste good that grow around here, and only one species that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one, the ostrich fern. So I'm going to teach you the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. First thing you want to look for is habitat. Ostrich ferns tend to prefer alluvial floodplain soil, and where you're going to typically see this along a large river. And we don't have a lot of large rivers in Stowe, you know, you've got the Asabet, but at that, at, 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 isn't really, there, are, there isn't a lot of alluvial habitat in the Asabet. But you're in the Merrimack watershed here, so if you go to the main stem Merrimack River, you can find the ostrich fern habitat. 
and that would be in Massachusetts. But this boat is actually taken along the Connecticut River out in Deerfield, where there are thousands and thousands of ostrich ferns. So um, I occasionally run into ostrich ferns in other places, but if you want to see you know, large patches of it, that's where I tend to see them. Okay, and then, um, as the little fiddleheads are developing, you'll notice that they're in a little vase-shaped clump, and also that each of the little stems on them has a little gouge that runs down the center of the stem, and if you cut the stem and you looked at it in cross-section, it would look like a U, all right? And then you'll see these little papery little scales that were wrapped around the fiddlehead parts, and those flake off really easily with your fingers, so it's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. And then the last thing to look for are the fertile fronds, the spore-bearing fronds that are tucked, uh, you know, they never get to be as tall as the fully-fledged fronds. And, uh, and they'll be there when the fiddleheads are coming out. They won't be at every clump of the ostrich fern fiddleheads, but you will see them in the patch. And those fertile fronds also have that U-shaped groove running down the little stem. So if you remember all that, that is the ostrich fern. And uh, so let me just, uh, um, talk about conservation in the context of this plant. So this is a plant that people will go and pick and sell to, you know, even supermarkets and stuff like that, and you'll see them. Although most of the fiddleheads that are sold in supermarkets around here, I think, are brought down from <coughs> Canada. But anyway, uh, so unfortunately, uh, sometimes the pickers will be a little bit unscrupulous in how hard they hit the patch, and they'll pick more than I think they should for actually the sustainability of a harvest from that patch. So the advice that I give is pick one or two of the little curl-up parts per clump. That's it. Let the rest grow out. Because if you picked every single one and then the plant produced a couple more to um, um, uh, recover from that, and then somebody went into the woods a week or two later and they picked those two, that's going to sap a lot of strength in the rhizome. You could kill the plant. So one or two per clump, that's a sustainable level of harvest. And I'll talk a little bit more about conservation in just a second. Okay, so if you've ever bought the ostrich turn at the store and cooked them up and you weren't particularly impressed with them, you might want to think of using the sweet corn method with them, which is basically sprints from the ostrich fern patch to the spot. And actually, this was illustrated very well by this naturalist, this woman, Beth Basler, who took me and a bunch of people to a fiddlehead patch out in Western Mass, and she brought her cook stove with her, and we were eating the fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them, and they were amazing that way. So that's how you get them at their best. All right, anybody know what this plant is? All right, this is a plant you may have heard of. It's called the wild leek, or ramps is the foodie name. And this is a plant that does not grow in Eastern Mass unless you plant it, so you won't find this naturally in the wild. It's more of a Western New England plant, so Western Mass, Vermont, uh, Western Connecticut is where you're more likely to see it. And uh, it's a wild onion. We have wild onions that have a similar flavor that you can harvest around here, but anyway. so. This is a plant that's a native species. It grows in sensitive rich woods habitats that it shares with a lot of our favorite ephemeral spring wildflowers like trilliums and bloodroots and stuff like that. And Native Americans use this plant. In fact, two city names that you will know, Winooski, Vermont, and Chicago, are Native American names for this species. So anyway, uh, it's a plant that um, uh, country people knew about that live where the plant grows, and they might collect some when they're out trout fishing or turkey hunting, things like that, and all that was fine. Then about 10 or 15 years ago, this plant began to experience a meteoric rise in popularity as the chefs and the foodies started hyperventilating about it, getting very excited about it. And the demand rose exponentially, and what unfortunately has resulted is this gold rush mentality on the part of some people where they're going to the woods not to commune with nature, not to have any connection themselves with nature, but just to dig up a patch like that and convert it to cash. And, and I've been in places in the Berkshires where I used to see patches like that where they have been completely wiped out. Every single plant was dug up. And these are not people gathering for themselves or a couple of friends. These are people that are selling these plants at a very large scale. And so not only is that bad for the sustainability of the plant, because once you dig it up, it's extirpated. It's locally extinct from that area. It's not going to come back. And also, the, um, if you leave any bare soil behind, you're creating this ideal growing medium for the invasive species to get a toehold in this sensitive rich woods habitat. So, um, so that's bad news. But there is some good news. So 
Here's a close-up of what the plants look like. So they'll have two or sometimes three leaves that go down to this little scallion-y type bulb. And, uh, and the leaves are delicious. So you don't have to dig up a plant to eat it. And so the word that I've been trying to get out to the chefs and the people that are picking for the chefs is please consider combining your, combining your harvesting to one leaf per plant only. Pick the leaf off the plant, leave the remaining leaf or leaves attached to the bulb, leave the bulb in the ground. It's a totally sustainable way of interacting with this plant. Then the patches will continue to exist and thrive in those locations and we'll get the wonderful flavor of the plant and that'll be great. So I have some anecdotal evidence that uh, my advice is getting out there because uh, a few years ago, I got an email and the email said, wild ramps in the subject line. And I thought, oh great, some foodie has tracked me down and wants me to spill my guts about some location of some wild leak patch they could go uh, um, dig up all the plants. And it turned out that email was from the produce manager at the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op, which is the one that serves Montpelier, Vermont. And he was writing to tell me that they had decided at their food co-op to sell little bags of only one leaf per plant collected ramps. And they wanted permission from me to put a little message for me in each bag to explain why that was a good idea. So I was very grateful for that. All right, so that's one bit of good news. Uh, because, uh, just to go back in the bad news one more time, so uh, if you look on the left, that's a picture I took at a famous restaurant in Westchester County, New York called uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barnes Restaurant. It's run by celebrity chef Dan Barber, and he wasn't even using the bulbs in his cuisine. He was just pickling them and selling them at a gift shop. In my view, those plants were unnecessarily dug up. And even the food co-op, some food co-ops were selling whole ramps. So, and you know, they've got the little local sticker on there. And you know, if you're the typical shopper, you say, local, local, I'm supposed to buy local. Local ramps, oh, I'm doing a good thing by buying the local ramps. And you're not if they're dug up plants. So anyway, but uh, there is an alternative, an alternative that you could do here, and that is you could grow them. You could have a little ramp patch established on your own property. Where do you get the plants to start out? From Garden in the Woods in Framingham. I was just there today, I saw that they grow ramps in a stock bed there and they potted up a whole bunch of plants. Um, and so you could just buy a half a dozen plants, yeah, put them in, yeah, and put them in in your, um, you know, you, you want to plant them in a place where eventually it's going to be shady because this is a plant that tolerates shade. Um, and, um, and then you could have your own ramp patch and enjoy them. But if you do that, I bet you don't dig up the plants because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. No, you leave the plants there, pick a leaf off occasionally, and then you have them to enjoy for later on. Okay, anybody know what this plant is? Okay, it is stinging nettle. All right, and this is one of the first plants I'm gathering, typically first green plants I'm gathering in the spring. And I will just snip off the top cluster of leaves uh, on each little plant and then bring them home and then I will uh, steam the nettle greens in a big cooking pot, and it shrinks quite a bit when you do that. And when you steam the nettle greens, it converts the chemical that causes the sting and the raw vegetable into a protein, so it makes the plants very healthy for you. And once I've steamed the nettle greens, you can incorporate them into different dishes, like this cream of stinging nettle soup, which is a recipe in my book, and also stinging nettle balls, and this is just the retro spinach ball recipe that uses Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together. <laughs> and you substitute the steamed nettle greens and it works great. All right, anybody know what this plant is? Yeah, it is a kind of mint, very good. Catnip. Catnip usually grows wild and it has the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you can use the leaves pressure dry, but I forgot to say that. Okay, here's a plant called curled or curly dock, and I saw this one on the way here today along the roadside. And um, it is a cousin of the French sorrel, so you can use it the same way. This one will have a bit of bitterness to it, so I tend to blanch the leaves, drop them into, into rapidly boiling water for 20 seconds. And that takes the bitterness away, and then you can use them like you'd use cooked spinach, like spanakopita, the, the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough and the feta cheese. The, the blanched uh, dock leaves work really well. So, uh, and this plant is the antidote to the sting and stinging nettle. If you get stuck by a nettle plant, you grab a dock leaf and get the juice out of it and then rub that juice on the place you got stung. It helps make the sting go away. All right, so uh, I also have live versions of 
what's appeared in this slide right here. So you can pass that around there and pass this around here and get a good look at it. Okay, so this plant is at or near the top of the invasive species list. It is despised by ecologists and uh, by homeowners and lots of people because once it gets established, it's really hard to eradicate. And a lot of people call it Mexican or Japanese bamboo. It's actually not even distantly related to bamboo. Its real name is Japanese knot. Okay? And so, um, so as I said, it's not related to bamboo. It's actually related to rhubarb. It tastes like rhubarb. Uh, and I use it instead of rhubarb. And, uh, and I harvest a ton of it every year. So, um, so if you can imagine in the fall, this is the plant that gets to be about eight feet tall and the stems turn this sort of reddish brown color and they look like dry bamboo. Okay, and then in the spring, in the midst of all that dried stuff or, or whatever got knocked down by the snow, you have these sprouts coming up that look like that, look like asparagus with little red dots on them. So at that stage, you could just snap it off at ground level and just steam the shoot for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to eat this plant is when they get a little taller. And this is what I call the wild rhubarb stage, which is basically what you're looking at, what I passed around. So like this tall or a little taller than this. And I'm picking the fattest sprouts I can because I want to peel this very outer layer off. There's nothing poisonous about it, but it's stringy and it can get caught in your teeth. So I'll take a little paring knife and just get it started at the bottom, and I'll just pull the outer layer off till I get this done. And then you see there's a stem on the right there where I've done that. Uh, and at that stage, the, the, the st stem is perfectly edible raw. It's tart, juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up and use it instead of <coughs> rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here's my strawberry knotweed pie. I made one of these just this afternoon. Wow. And virtually everybody I feed this to prefer this over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's really yummy. And so you might be looking at that and say, well, okay, it's yummy, but I'm